BA Takie Kura. Ape nara koutou nga pou waitaka a o tō tātou matua tipuna. E mihi atu o tō ātawhi tō te kōhaka kai kai a waro nō maru maru a mako tere mako whakaruru hau o nga i tua huriri o te mana whenua. O reira e te kai haunihera a mō tō tiamana tumaki e mihi atu, e mihi atu kia koutou katoa. E te pirangi au ki tō maumahara ki tētahi kaumātua e whakapau kaha ki whakarite ki uru e whakaro Māori ki roto i tēnei kaunihera. O reira e oku kaumātua o naitua hururi Nā ki era kehu, nā ti kuri ki maunga manu. Nō reira e haira tūrā e Claire Marie Williams. Mō tō whānau o Ohorama, mō tō whānau Jacobs, mō tō whānau o Blackadder. E nō reira e Claire e haira tūrā, haira tūrā ki tā pāta whakawairua. E takoto, takoto, takoto. Takoto i rangimāri i rungi tō waka, hoi atu tō waka ko tō e tārai, haere, haere e haere atu rā. E haere atu rā ki te pāta whakawairua e kle, haere atu rā he e Hawaiki nui, Hawaiki rō, Hawaiki pāmamao. Nō reira e te whānau pani, ki a kaha, ki a maia, a ki a manua nui, me tō poropora aki i nehu o naitu ahuriri, e te whānau aroha nui. O reira i koutou rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou e mihi atu kia koutou katoa. I just wanted to stand to acknowledge a kaumātua rangatira whaia who had actually a lot to do with our kaiau, with the environment, uh, Papa Tuanuku, and was very instrumental um, in ensuring that the Māori version or world view was actually something that was taken into account on the decisions of this council. And so in the spirit of uh, partnership, in the spirit of whānau, whanaungatanga, um, I bring that to this council meeting, the beginning of it, to acknowledge Claire and also um, to send our support and aroha as we did when we went to Tuihiwi as a council uh, last week during her uh, tangihanga. Orida, thank you for uh, allowing us to perform those protocols and acknowledgement of Poroporaki and to acknowledge someone that gave so much to the environment. Orida, e I think it'd be good to open and maybe there's other of my colleagues here that would like to um, say a few words in remembrance of Claire. Mia. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Croco. Look, Claire was a significant person that helped us build, I guess, the framework of where we've got to today. She was an instrumental. She was a hard charging, hard woman <laughs> to deal with. I know that Councillor Cranwell's had a couple of major run-ins with her and, and <laughs> And, but but that's you know that's that's good that's a good thing to do. So Yane, do you want to acknowledge? Do you want to make an acknowledgement? Aku rotato mia nei te mia tu kia koe a tu te hauru kuna i i mia tu a kia e te marae kura e Claire a e te kato e wahi ni kaha mo te taio mo ngā awa mai ki tu ki tai mo te mahi o mo te IMP iwi management plan i noho ana e te tu wai hora. A joint management board, um, itimata ia ki um, te wai makiriri me te uh, wai kiri kiri uh, zone committees at Atu Mahi. And just acknowledging Claire her, her passion for the environment. Um, as we, as monks whanau, we always have ups and downs, but uh, she stuck to her values and um, and what she passed down from her tipuna, and she's carried that on to her children. And then her passion and that will be carry on uh, besides her favourite nakahuri and her. Um, Inaka 
uh, white bait um, uh, catching spots. Kilda. Um, so other councillors need to say something. We have uh, done this acknowledgement. This is our official one to Claire and Claire's family. Uh, Greg. Morena. Thank you. Uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, I work very closely with uh, Claire and the uh, Runanga for the last sort of 25 years uh, through my role with Waimaka Riri Environment Canterbury and Te Kohaka or Tu Haitara. Um, previously, it had been noted by uh, Councillor Kurako uh, that she was very rarely alone. Uh, and uh, while I certainly send my, my thoughts to her extended family, uh, both at Tuahiwi and uh, up at Mongamanu and elsewhere, uh, I, I certainly want to send out my thoughts too to the likes of Kawana uh, and the people who will be really, uh, you know, feeling this loss as part of her extended family. So, uh, uh, got it. Um, and I think Claire, you you had a close association also with uh, with Claire with out an eye, Claire. Thank you. Um, Peter, for the opportunity. Look, I felt so privileged to have spent seven odd years with um, Claire sitting around the Waimakariri Water Zone Committee and also her involvement in the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, as I understand it, um, right through. And she certainly was a lady who had very strong values, but she taught a lot of us in the wider community about the values of Mahinga Kai and the Naitahu values. And and I will. I hold that dear to my heart and, and my knowledge. And I just feel so privileged that I was part of the OP that went to Tuahiwi um, on Thursday to pay my respects to Claire and um, extend my sympathy to her family. So um, yeah, she's a person that will remain very visual to me. Um, and and I'm just like pleased to have the privilege to work with her and, and to know her. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Look, uh, we will note uh, this bereavement in our minutes. Uh, that, so we acknowledge uh, the passing of Claire and will formally express sympathy, the condolences to the Williams Whanau. Uh, councillors were provided with an opportunity to convey their sympathies here today, which is what we're doing. Now, I understand, Claire, that you've got something else. Thank you, Mr Chair. Just um, through you, I'd like to take the opportunity, if I may, to just also acknowledge Michael Blackwell. Now, Michael, um, many of you will know of Michael. The Waimakariri Zone Committee members support staff, sorry, I'm going to read this, <laughs> support staff and councillors and many across the Waimakariri community were deeply saddened by the recent passing of Michael Blackwell. And he passed peacefully at home on the 17th of May, much too young, actually. Michael had represented his community on the Zone Committee since 2017. Um, ironically, actually, it was the meeting that Claire Williams stood down at. Um, joining when the committee was leading the community engagement for the Waimakariri SIP addendum that contributed to Plan Change 7 of the Canterbury Land and Water Management, uh, Regional Plan, sorry. From the time he joined the committee, Mike was immediately liked and respected by all. His passion for the issues at hand and rapport with everyone, regardless of their viewpoint, naturally led him to becoming the chair of the committee in August 2019. And it was a role he maintained until his decision to step down as chair in January of this year. Michael was passionate about the environment, particularly wetlands and waterways. And as Mayor Dean Gordon from Waimakariri noted recently, Michael was instrumental in lobbying for the council's re recent purchase of a lineside road property that has significant potential to better the water quality of the Kaiapoi River. Michael was delighted to learn of the council um, had recently confirmed that purchase, which he considered to be the biggest victory through his work on the Zone Committee. Michael was somebody known throughout the community for his many contributions, none more so than his role alongside his brother Andrew as a fifth generation to manage Blackwell's department store in Kaiapoi, and it was a Kaiapoi institution suffered considerable damage in the earthquake and was rebuilt. In January, sorry, in 2022, the District Council jointly acknowledged Andrew and Michael with a special business award on behalf of the Blackwell family for 150 years service to the business and community. 
On behalf of Environment Canterbury, I would like to acknowledge Michael's years of service to the community and the environment. He has been a leader that the community related to as one of their own, someone who would listen and do whatever he could to assist. He was a true gentleman, ever thoughtful and considerate, who showed great courage as he battled his illness over the last couple of years. He will be sorely missed by many, and our thoughts are with his far now, his wife, Sarah, and their children, Emma and Finlay. And a memorial wake has been held for Michael this Friday in Kaiapoi at two o'clock. If anybody's interested in going, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Keo. I think it's a significant uh, process for us to acknowledge these people and, and the contributions that ha they have made and others have made also, but in their passing, we should note those things. Uh, and they and, and they shape what we do. You know, they have been a big part of us. It's not just about this council, it's about those communities and those people that want to take um, pretty much unpaid time out and put the work in. So thank you for that, for those two things. We will also note Michael in the minutes, his passing and his contribution. So thank you for that. All right, now let's, uh, if we can go back to where we need to be. Uh, yes, I will go and do that. So welcome to uh, the 563rd Council meeting of, of uh, Canterbury Regional Council. Been informed that there is a quorum. Uh, there will be a change in the order of business with this meeting. At approximately 11.30, uh, after agenda item 8.3, we'll move to agenda uh, item 9, and we will go into public excluded. Uh, we expect to return to the open meeting at approximately 1 o'clock, so that will be uh, after the lunch break. Uh, come back to the open meeting and we'll start with agenda item 8.7 and 8.9. So sorry about the confusion about how we're going to go about this, but it's just to fit um, some other guests in that are coming a bit uh, later. So, and I guess I'll get told if it changes again. So they'll direct me. I've got these people up here that direct me, so that'll be good. Um, look, uh, there are no apologies, but significantly we've got two councillors online. We've got Councillor Ward online. I saw you before, Councillor Ward and we've got Councillor Pauling online, so they're uh, fully part of this process that we're going through today. Uh, so, Craig, can you hear me? Yes, sure can, Peter, thank yeah. you. And and uh, Councillor Ward? Yes, I can hear you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been notified there are no conflicts of interest. Uh, public forums and deputations will move to next, and the first one of those is Ben Smith and Scott Hobson. Who are here with us? Uh, we, uh, and if you come forward, yes. Um, ben is here to talk about the collabor collaboration he has developed with the College and developed a technology that monitors the reduction in nitrate, out nitrate outputs from pastures. Now, note that we have got your, um, we have got your, um, your slides. Um, you haven't got a lot of time. You've got ten minutes for the presentation, and then we will do some questions after that. But we do have these slides. Oh, yes, sorry. Oh, my God, fellas. OK, so we're not using the slides, but just in terms of timing, just in terms of timing, uh, Ben, uh, uh, Vivian, will, she's got a wee bell here. She'll ring it at nine minutes, and that'll give you an opportunity to to wind down. Thank you for that, uh, Mr Chair. I just... Um, want to firstly um, acknowledge uh, the passing of uh, two members of the public and the acknowledgement that, that the regional council have paid today. Um, you know, um, I think it's an important part of the process of environmental consideration. Um, my uh, tūpuna originate from the um, from South Otago um, of Greenfield, uh, the Smith um, family. Um, so we were on the eighth generation um, on, on this whenua. And um, my Murahuku background um, on the Mackenzie side, I'd like to acknowledge that as well. So I, I just um, wanted to do that. So I'll, I'll let Scott introduce himself. I'm the timekeeper. Uh, we're on it. Yep. OK, thanks, Scott. Sure. OK, thank you. I'm Scott Hobson. I've been working in the field of microbiology and soils uh, and trying to reduce leaching for the last 21 years, um, including uh, fertiliser before that. So I believe the drinking water standards are proposed to be heading down towards two milligrams of nitrate N per litre. At the moment, America has gone down to 1.9. It sets incredibly difficult tasks, but not impossible. Uh, yet, if I asked a farmer 
what his leaching was in terms of drinking water standards, he wouldn't be able to tell me unless he knows the drainage from his farm. Uh, for example, Lincoln University have got down to 42 kilos of nitrogen per hectare and achieved their 30% reduction uh, ECAN targets. But at 200 mils of drainage, that equates to 21 milligrams of nitrate nitrogen per litre. The Australasian Journal of Environmental Management, as quoted from a paper from Mike Joy uh, recently in Stuff, says that Canterbury is on a trajectory to 21 milligrams of nitrate N per litre. How realistically can it be anything else when we have 21 milligrams each year going in at the top? Next slide. So this is a real situation on a red zone, red zone um, soil and farm that's told they have to reduce leaching by 90%. Uh, we've achieved that with them. So the standard loading is about 32 milligrams of nitrate N per litre, somewhere between 20, 200 mils and 300 mils of drainage. And we've got it down to mostly around 1.8 milligrams of nitrate N per litre. So Dr. Lisa Box from Ag Research, it's quoted from a Farmer's Weekly article on the 27th of February, uh, rightly pointed out that solving nitrogen leaching is not as simple as simply adding more plantain to pastures, as the nitrogen loading is the most important thing for nitrogen leaching potential. Currently, Overseer Nutrient Management System makes an assumption on the nitrogen and pasture for our red zone farm of around roughly 4.3 to 4.6% nitrogen in the diet. That determines the nitrogen output in the urine. The loadings per urination will be roughly 25 grams per P. Reducing the dietary nitrogen to 2.8% reduces the urine output and the nitrogen loading per urination goes down to about 6 grams. That's our data, says that. The data we are collecting is now showing nitrate, nitrogen and drainage water can get down below the proposed two milligrams of N per litre. We've got a little bit of help. Some of our products are acting, looks like a DCD equivalents, so that adds some horsepower to that reduction, quite a lot. Problem is, as long as the dietary nitrogen is high, at say 4.6%, the loadings are elevated in the P and you cannot reach targets of even 11.2 or only just with even just one cow per hectare. So it's critical that we start driving reductions in dietary nitrogen if we want to have a chance of reaching two milligrams of nitrates per litre. Uh, this is the data is showing, this is from lysimeters we have on that red zone farm. The data is showing the changes in nitrates between what is a normal loading of 20 to 30 grams per P in the green bars and what is a real loading from one of our clients in the blue, which is around six grams per P. So very big differences. This is directly under the P. Uh, when we apply that into slightly more um, uh, complete formulas, we end up with around 32 milligrams for the current uh, most farm situations. Two cows a hectare would show 21 milligrams per hectare, uh, 20, not 21 milligrams of nitrate N per litre, and the magnified side at two and a half cows a hectare is showing around 1.8. So these changes can occur, but we have to do everything absolutely right. Now, if you want to get down next, yeah, if you want to drop uh, nitrates down in wells that are already elevated, you have to put in lower concentrations above than what's in the well. So you've got to get them down towards two milligrams. Otherwise, it's only going to increase, albeit slowly. It's a given part. Just why Australasian Journal says we're on a trajectory towards 21. Now, initially, when I started this talk, my goal was to get adjustments made to the overseer assumption number using herbage tests. Now, nobody I spoke to, including ECAN staff, said it could be done through overseer. However, in the middle of the night last night, after an awful lot of driving at about three o'clock in the morning, 
I found there is scope with an overseer to override the assumption in real data, albeit think from interpretation of looking at last night, six herbage tests per year for five years. That may, I also saw another part that looked like we could do it straight away. Um, so I'm not sure there. But that, so that the task of getting this critical issue into the farming community is now one of education and promotion. Now, the advantages that I see in driving this system is it's a fair system based on reality. The biggest polluters can be identified. It's also one of the only ways, the most intense way, to actually make really significant impact. It reduces the risk from future biological solutions, maybe a trichoderma fungus, from becoming weak and ineffective over time. If we just think, right, trichoderma's got it sorted, it probably won't over time. They'll get weaker and have less impact because they're usually raised as monocultures. It reduces the risk of research that doesn't stack up in field situations when the variables are increased massively compared to more controlled environments. Farmers can use nitrogen. Those lysimeters are showing 100, we've put 190 kilos of nitrogen a hectare on there, and we're still down at 1.8. Farms have a clear direction based on the science that works and how they get there is up to them. It benefits animal health and production. Getting nitrates down will benefit mental health throughout the community, both rural and urban, and we can sure do with that at the moment. Uh, a battle over who will pay for the 1.8 billion nitrate removal plant for Christchurch can be avoided. It will dilute pre-existing soil loadings and improve wells. Uh, if a wonder product like DCDs that were banned in the past is, comes on the market again and is removed again from the market, then the base system is robust. Uh, all farmers can be treated individually because we've actually got some useful data. It's very simple and easy to implement. Now, the barriers that I've found, A, is just a straight out lack of uh, understanding of these things. So the young people that I've talked to here in ECAN, for example, understand what I'm talking about and go, why hasn't this been done already? The older people, um, not so easy, uh, a bit more stuck in their ways and go, uh, go overseer is going to cover it all. So the older hands maybe need reminding of this and the young ones need education. So this is how we do that. And that's real numbers on a red zone farm. So I propose Perhaps that we push for a workshop where we can actually, I can slow down <laughs> and anyone that's interested can come along and get, start to get the extras to make this like, make a lot more sense. Thank you for that. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Now, what we do now is we have uh, questions of clarification. This is not a debate with you. It's uh, to clarify some of the stuff that you put on the table. Genevieve. Thank you guys for your great WeChat there. Um, I just wanted clarity on the reduction of the topical synthetic nitrogen that you can get down to requiring on pastures. Um, what, what have you seen as a reduction um, on average? <laughs> uh, we have um, clients. That's my timer. Thank you. I'm on time. Uh, we have clients uh, that. Uh, have reduced from 250 kilos of nitrogen down to 50 and actually grow more grass. Um, that has an impact and that largely indirectly shows that we're starting to control what's called nitrifying uh, bacteria. So they control the speed from a stored product like ammonia to nitrates. And it's because that speed happens too quickly, you end up with excess that flow through. So this also flows on exactly to nitrous oxide emissions. So we can potentially get rid of 16 to 20% of the total greenhouse gas emissions by following what we're talking about here. So an additional question um, with regards to you talking about animal welfare. Um, so um, what do you see in the animal health from this process? Uh, Dr. Lutie Waldron has already pointed this out in peer-reviewed papers, uh, that as you drop 
at a high risk, high risk, um, there's a high risk of animal health issues when we have high protein. Now, internationally, high protein is anything over about 3.2%, sorry, 3.2% nitrogen. So that's around 20% protein to 25. So she's recommended in her papers to solve these leaching issues that we actually come down to at least 16%. Now, most of our farms in New Zealand are 26 to 36% protein. So we have extremely high levels. So what we see is in line with her papers, we see an increase in animal production. We see a um, about a halving in what's called the empty rates. That's the cows that won't get pregnant. We see very little lame cows. The average lame cow rate is 30% for the country. Um, and we see reductions in the fertilizer component. I would have to say that the fertilizer component won't just solve this problem because of those numbers I was pointing in there, say the 105 milligrams for the current current models of high protein, um, only about four milligrams of that from our data is actually due to the urea component from the fertilizer. That's why we're, we're really dreaming if we think just by reducing urea without reducing dietary nitrogen is actually going to solve the problem. Thank you, uh, Councillor Karako, and then we've got Councillor Southworth, and then I think we're going to let you gentlemen leave. Thank you. Tēnā uh, kōrua. Ā e mi hapi kā koe o te whanaunga o muri eku o tākou. Nā mei ben. Um, this is just a um, clarification because one of your last slides um, was actually around barriers. So I understand attitude and I understand age. Can you just elaborate a bit on the politics part of it? Yeah, the cornerstone of it is is the understanding, the lack of understanding at the moment. Um, and, and the thing is that, that we're finding, um, particularly within the farming community, we've got the older community of, you know, this is the way that we've done it in the past, this is the way we're going to do it, and they're fighting against you. But you see the changes that we've noted in Overseer, with six pasture samples being a medium and a mechanism of doing, that's a change in attitude of the farming community in order to monitor their own impacts. And if we can educate people through forums like this, like yourselves, um, it gives us an ability to influence an outcome, which at the end of the day, you're the guardians of that um, everything there. And, and we're very aware of how much waiting you've got on by, by government and public in order to change the outcomes of the water. Yeah, just clarity, and I think Genevieve's question sort of you partly have answered, but you have the image with the two fields both having the same application at the 190 kilos per hectare, and then different, quite substantial differences in the leaching. And obviously, and, you, and now you've said that the nitrous oxides can also be reduced, because my head, I thought, well, is it going up to the sky instead of going down to the wall? Because the end's got to go somewhere, right? So, but you're not actually advocating to be able to maintain that 190 kilos. You're saying, actually, there's a whole part in the mix here, which fundamentally must, presumably that N is going, and clarify for me, is going into production. So you're saying it's growing more grass even with less application. The animals are reducing their NPs in their P. And so that N is instead going to producing milk or meat. Is that in a nub? You're 100% correct. Just as so. so. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, we are extending and we're taking some time off our friends at the back that have to do, but thank you very much for this. Um, we, we've got a recommendation here if you'd like to wait till we've got that, so we'll put that up on the screen, can we? Um, well, I'll read it. Uh, oh, here it comes. So there's, that's the recommendation in terms of your uh, deputation to us today, uh, that the Council receives the public forum from uh, yourself, um, Ben, as you know, item 4.1, public forum provides a reply to be in as soon as it's practical. So could I have a move for that? Thank you, Genevieve. Seconded by Councillor Southworth. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that is carried. So thank you. Uh, good to see you. All right. So if we can move you, David, um, if you'd like to come forward. So we've got David Hawke here. David, who is representing the Hallswell Residents Association, and David has been here before. Uh, and he's here today to talk about the results of a Horsewell public transport survey. So that's the purpose, David. 
And we'll start when you're ready to start, David. We'll start. How about now? So, so uh, Tena Koltu, uh, I'm David Hawkes. So I'm Secretary of Horsel Residents Association. Normally, I would have John Bennett, our chair, sitting next to me, but um, he's been uh, waylaid at Christchurch Hospital for some uh, work on his innards. So uh, hopefully, we'll have him back next time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. So we're talking to you primarily about barriers to public transport usage and uptake, primarily in Horsfall, uh, but I think some of the ideas apply elsewhere as too. So you might know that our association aims to uh, promote, preserve and protect the interests of Horsfall residents. And part of that uh, benefiting community environment is ensuring that people in Horsfall have access to a full range of uh, transport choices. So if someone wants to walk, bike or catch the bus easily, they can do that in a timely fashion. So in doing our work, we want to engage as broad a range of people as possible. And to help us out, we've, uh, for a couple of years now, we've run surveys using the Horsell Community Facebook page. And we use the results of those surveys to uh, broaden our views. So what I'm talking to you today is the survey that we've run most recently. And as I've said, it's talking about barriers to public transport. So we wanted to catch the views of both users and non-users of the bus. So the survey itself has got around over 240 responses. We do know that uh, you are contemplating a Horsfall route review. And we're also told that uh, you are intending to have a new system up and running with the public transport priority projects that are in place uh, being planned at the moment for Horsfall Road and Nankin Road. For us as a residents association, things are always more complicated when multiple agencies are involved. And obviously that's what we have with public transport. Nevertheless, we can see ECAN as having the prime responsibility for public transport and um, we think that it's your job to ensure that all agencies are broadly paddling in the same direction. So I thought we would start a little bit with uh, bus routes. Uh, ECAN obviously has the primary role in delivering bus routes. So from our survey, a third of the respondents do not have a bus stop within easy walking distance. And that's enormous. So, and it gives an idea of the size of the problem that you're uh, route review will need to address. At the other end, about a quarter have routes that don't go where they want them to. So three quarters do, but a quarter don't. Something comes through really strongly, and, and this is it's a really complex situation, but uh, potential for having people change buses on the way, about half do not want to change buses. Built into that, is that about a quarter of our respondents of what you might call complex journeys. So an example of that might be dropping children at school on the way to work. So that's more or less about the actual routes and the coverage and the gaps in the system that we have at the moment. We then move to the question of bus stops, which is nominally a city council responsibility. So over half would not feel happy sending an eight or an 80 year old off to the nearest bus stop. And we think that is absolutely appalling. And you can see it as a real impediment to building bus patronage. So we think that uh, you need to be working with city council to fix this. Perhaps you already are, and that would be fantastic, but uh, that is a real issue. Similarly, just under half think that the bus stops, once they get there, don't provide adequate shelter. And there's a, sw a relatively small proportion, about 15%, think they don't think feel safe there either. Still on bus stops, thinking about building patronage, um, about two thirds think that putting secure bike or scooter parking at bus stops would help them catch the bus more often. So, those are some things that, uh, you know, they're just a snapshot, but they really gel with our experience of using the bus. So we've got the issue of not being able to easily access bus stops, and then we've got the issue of um, of actually getting to the bus stop in a, in, a, in a timely fashion. 
So in all of this, I guess we'll be interested to see how you put together your route review and how you involve other agencies such as City Council and Waka Kotahi. So, no, it's in some respects the public transport priority lanes that are planned, they're still a couple of years away before they're implemented. That time is going to go very, very quickly. And uh, we've said to you previously, I think most recently in the context of your draft annual plan, that you actually need to get a move on. Um, thanks for listening. Kia ora. Thank you, David, as always, and the work that you put in um, and keep us on the ball on these things. I know this is topical for us. Uh, so questions of clarification around David, David's presentation. Uh, uh, David, uh, thanks for coming in. I think you, um, you, you touched on a lot of stuff around safety when we were talking. There. Can you just maybe just say a couple of words around the safety stuff that you found from the survey? Yeah, so the safety issue is primarily getting across roads. Um, the place where we have lived, we have uh, a bus stop nominally within walking distance, but we would never send either a youngster or an old person on that route because they have to cross um, a busy road, Horsell Junction Road. And uh, there's not just the time aspect, it's how you actually get across safely. And it's that crossing of roads safely is the primary safety issue, I think. Thank you, Councillor Swiggs. Uh, anybody else uh, for David? Might get away lightly, David. But thank you for coming in and sharing that with us. Uh, obviously, it's a watch the space with us, but the recommendation uh, that we have in front of us is that we receive the public forum uh, from David Hawke regarding agenda item 4.1 public forum, provide you with uh, a reply as soon as possible. So, moved by Councillor. Um, Davies and seconded by Councillor Sunkel. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, very much. Yeah. Um, uh, welcoming uh, Mark uh, Christensen. Uh, he's the council for the Kia project uh, and representing the South Island Resource Recovery Limited. He's here to present a deputation regarding gender agenda item 8.3, which has just been referred to, a uh, request for Minister for the Environment to call in resource consent applications lodged by South Island Resource Recovery Limited and the implication for it, for them. So when you're ready, mate. Kia ora koutou, uh, rauranga te ora um, The applicant's position is, is set out in the letter that I sent to you on Monday, and I don't want to uh, repeat that, but just make um, two points. Um, the first is that uh, I see no merit in the reasons provided in the officer's report, which purport to form a basis for a call-in, and I've set out in that letter and attachment the reasons for that. And the second point is that the applicant is confident that this council has both the competence and the capability to undertake your normal functions under the RMA. However, if you don't think that is the case, then that's up to you. Now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Look, that's uh, one of the shortest deputation. I don't know where you're going, but thank you for coming in and putting that place in. And as you have said, the information that we have had and had been able to digest up to this point in time uh, will inform 8.3 when we get to 8.3. Uh, but has anyone got a clarification question for uh, Councillor um, McKenzie? Uh, just can I just check with Chief? Can I just ask? It's a tricky space, uh, Mark, for us um, where we're at, um, and and you understand that we can't, it being the space you're in, we can't do this. Okay, Mark. So we're just going to get this sorted out. So you you re, you refer to the letter. The letter isn't on the table at the moment. The councillors want. All right. I, well, I'd be happy to table the letter um, formally. Thank you. Okay. So we'll wait till that process has uh, been complete. Then councillors can ask for clarification around the, late, the letter that you alluded to, Mark. So just for clarification, uh, this letter was. Uh, written on the 19th of June by Mark. 
and it addresses the issues of significance um, and it addresses um, the uh, the response that Mark's put in the in the right hand column there. So the other issues around this letter that councillors need clarification on. Unless you're hundred percent sure it's clarification. Are you hundred percent sure, Councillor Southworth? Well, go with you, John, please. Uh, thank you. you. You note in, in the letter um, the challenge of, I guess, localism, the ability of, of locals to, uh, I guess, further engage in the process. My understanding is that the process may be brought back to Canterbury or wherever it can. So any comment on, on, on your view of, of local? I'm just looking at, at the position. So either of the call-in processes, is, which is firstly a board of inquiry or uh, through the environment court directly, do call for a submission process. So individuals can, can make submissions in that process. So that's not the issue. The issue is really, around, nor is the location, so that can happen locally. The issue is more around um, the formality of the process because um, experience has shown that um, as much as a board of inquiry and a a court will try to encourage local uh, individual people to feel comfortable in that forum. It is by its very nature more formal than the normal consenting process. And the experience is that, uh, you know, some people feel intimidated by that process uh, uh, compared with the normal two step process through the system. Thanks, mate. Look, I, I think if you don't mind, Mark, we might leave it there. Uh, we've got a discussion coming up with councillors. Uh, Councillor Branwell. I just think as the letter's been entabled, and I know at the end of the letter there, Mark, that you talk about, um, you said, uh, you mentioned iwi. Um, what, in a sense, just some clarification, what, are, what, is your, what has your applicant's role been in working with uh, iwi or mana whenua down there? Uh, the... the Applicant sees that mana whenua's um, advice and position is critical on on, on issues, uh, and has been endeavouring to work as closely as they can with the local uh, runanga. Um, that's an ongoing process. We're in the process of of still waiting for a formal cultural impact assessment from the runanga, um, but it's an important, a very important part of the process. I think I can ask this question. So, in your letter, Mark, you mentioned concern around the constituents' ability and local people's ability to engage in this process. And you've got concern around Environment Canterbury's reputation in saying, actually, this is something significant that we need to pass on and that we're, we're concerned. But obviously, you represent the developer. So, I'm just curious, and it's not clear to me, what's your concern about it being called in? Because my understanding is in terms of the law and the regulations and so on, it will be determined against the same criteria. So what's the what's the negative impact for the developer? I know the applicant's not concerned about it. We'll let you escape, actually. Um, uh, but thank you for that. And thank you, councillors, for your consideration. As I say, we have got this in front of us soon. So, Mark, your, the recommendation that we have here for you is it's just that we received a deputation from you, Mark, representing South Island Resource Recovery Limited regarding an agenda item, and as this is an ongoing item, there won't be any correspondence with you. So, could I have a move to that, please? Thank you, Claire. Seconded by Dion. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, uh, that is carried. Now, if we're moving to the next item, which is 4.2.2, uh, and we have Robert Island. Uh, Robert, I'll wait for you to come to the screen, Robert. Robert is the chair of Why Waste Waimati, is online to present a deputation re relating to item 8.3, request for Minister uh, of the Environment to call and resource consent applications lodged by South Island Resource Recovery Limited. Welcome, Robert. Uh, and, and, and you've been online. I've seen you online there before. So you've got 10 minutes. Uh, we do a wee bell at nine, um, but when you're ready to go, you can go. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, my address today is in regards to the Council's request for a ministerial call in of the Resource Consent Application by South Island Resource Recovery Limited, uh, Cyril. I was present at yesterday's Waimati District Council meeting where discussions and a subsequent decision was made in regards to a staff request for a ministerial call in of Cyril's resource consent application. As a local resident of Waimati, I would like to give a local community group's perspective on comments made by Cyril representatives in regards to significant public interest. As I'm aware, the ECAM will be holding some Babbage listed on the agenda to give a deputation on behalf of Cyril. This never took place. However, Cyril did provide a statement to councillors to use when determining their decision. This included references from the RMA, which the council would use to give reasons for requesting the call in. Cyril supplied responses to each of the listed reasoning criteria provided by council staff. I would like the opportunity to respond to Cyril's comments in regards to the widespread public interest criteria. As, as I believe some of the comments made by Cyril do not provide an honest representation of public interest surrounding this proposal. I'm part of a community group from Waimati who opposed this proposal called Why Waste Why Matty. We are an incorporated society group with over 200 fully paid members, making us one of the largest community groups in our district. We also have both online and paper petitions, totaling well over 2,000 signatures from people opposed to this proposal from all around the country. We also have an internet and social media presence, which brings a constant amount of interest from all around the country. Why Waste Why Matty held a community protest recently, which was attended by over 100 locals, all opposed to this plant. This protest took place on a weekday and was a very good response for a small town like Why Matty. A group of all the local Why Matty doctors also released a statement opposing the plant, highlighting real health concerns. Yesterday's council meeting was attended by a large group of concerned residents. This resulted in attendees standing outside the doors. I've been present at many Waimati District Council meetings, and this was by far the most packed meeting I have attended. This is testament of the significant public interest in this proposal. There are a number of other national groups who also oppose this proposal, including the Zero Waste Network and Greenpeace as well as other community groups who are opposing similar proposals in their districts. This has been, there has been, sorry, significant media coverage from all around the country, including Radio New Zealand, Newsroom and Business Desk, not to mention extensive local coverage on the Stuff platform and the Otago Daily Times. There have been numerous letters to the editor and all the local papers about the proposal. Frank Films also made a short film on the Project Care proposal asking the question, is waste energy really needed within New Zealand? Cyril in their address stated that there is a small group of passionate locals who oppose this plant and that outside of the region, the application has re received very little coverage with no real media interest outside of the local and regional papers. This is untrue and is not a fair representation of the facts. They failed to mention the protests that took place while the company was in town, which also saw significant media and social media attention. Also not mentioned was the fact that this proposal was con condemned by all the town's doctors, something that is unprecedented. I would like to finish by stating that Councillor Kane yesterday ask for it to be noted that the council fully supports that this proposal is publicly notified to allow for local input into the consenting process. This, I believe, is very important and I would ask that ECAN councillors make the same request as part of the ministerial call-in request. I thank you for your time.
Thank you, Robert. I would note um, just just that that is um, the text of a letter that you have sent to us. Um, much of it, um, yes. and if you would like us to table that, then we can attach that to our minutes. Ye yes, I would make that request. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, matters of clarification, Councillor McKenzie. Well, this is a question to you and Stephanie rather than to uh, the submitter. He's, he's, the, the submitter is clearly opposing and uh, 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 supporting the call-in on the grounds that that's more likely to uh, have the uh, process, uh, have the applicant turned down. Uh, but we're, we aren't debating the merits of the case. We are only deba de debating whether, in fact, uh, what is the appropriate process for which the applicant to be considered this this application for consent should be considered. And so, I'm just, so I, I haven't quite finished. So I'm just questioning whether it's appropriate to have that submission in the first place. It, look, it is. Uh, it, it's it, people can uh, submit to us on anything they propose, right? Anything they please. Um, on the matter, this matter, in this matter, we have a discussion soon about this issue. And uh, we we uh, have no predetermination on that whatsoever in terms of what our decision will be. Uh, I do not think that the Waimati decision, in terms of my reading of this room anyway, will be uh, influence what we decide. So is that what you require? No, the, no. The point is, is that we're not discussing the merits of the application of the consent. We're not saying we want it or we don't want it. What we're saying is, uh, <coughs> our advice from our staff and. And uh, is that the prop the best process for this application to be considered is through a call in. What this submitter has been t is telling us is he's opposed to the application in the first place. Get this 100 percent right, and we're not going to go any more discussion on that point, right? So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you if you've got any questions of clarification of Robert. If not, we will let Robert go, uh, and then we will move on in our business. We're not having a discussion about what Robert has said. We're just going to do some clarity. Any cl there's no clarity, that's fine. Doesn't look like there's any. So, Robert, thank you very much for making that. Um, sorry, sorry, Mr. sorry, Mr. Chair. Could I just add that my my um the clarification that I'd like to provide that is that my submission was actually about the significant public interest. Yep, look, that's fine. Look, we'll judge that as we've seen it. Uh, people's personal interpretations of that are up to them, Robert. Uh, but, yep. but thank you for that. Uh, and can I just say that the recommendation that we have for you is similar to the one that we had for Mark Christensen, and it's just a note that we've had this deputation from you uh, because there is no circular issue here for us to get back a report on you because this is about a process that's uh, going to be decided uh, when we get to 8.3, so I've got a mover for that, please. Now, thank you, Councillor Southworth, and seconded by Councillor Sunkel. So, all those in favour, please say aye. All those against, now that's carried. Now, thank you, Robert, for that. Um, thank and you for your time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, Catherine, people, people are happy to do that. Um, all right. Yeah, let's let's move to item 8.3. So item 8.3 is request for Minister for the Environment to call in resource consent applications lodged by South Island Resource Recovery Limited. It's on pages 82 to 97 of the and, and the recommendation is on page 82. Uh, we've got Aurora Grant, who's our Consents Planning Manager and Lee Griffiths as Acting Director of Operations. And I would also ask Robin Fitchett, our General Counsel, to come to the table to introduce this item. Now, as we normally do, um, uh, they will introduce the item. There will be questions of clarification of them. We'll ask them to step down and then we'll have a discussion about once we put the recommendation, we'll have recommendation, we'll have a discussion. Is everyone happy with that process? Everyone's happy with that process. We're in your hands, Aurora. Thank you. Um, the purpose of uh, this paper before you today is um, to decide to seek approval uh, to request ministerial call-in um, for the project peer application. Um, before I move into uh, the 
running through the paper, um, I have some points of clarification, correction, or a process um, to take you through. Um, so first point, um, I'd like to update uh, point four of the paper um, that notes that Waimati District Council um, may also request a call in. Uh, as you've heard, that um, process has uh, now concluded and Waimati District Council um, has uh, determined that they will be requesting a call in from the Minister. Um, secondly, I'd like to make a correction to paragraph six of the paper. Uh, there is a typo in there that states uh, 700 truckloads of waste. I'd like to correct that to uh, 70 uh, truckloads of waste. Um, and lastly, a clarification to paragraph uh, 42 and 43 of the paper um, regarding the climate change impacts. To clarify the, the climate change impacts that are considered in this paper are um, environment Canterbury's jurisdiction. Uh, I would like to clarify that the, um, the Minister and the EPA um, have slightly different jurisdictional um, considerations there and um, they differ from what council could consider for this paper. Um, I would like to put forward though that that um, consideration was not um, factored in into the staff recommendation um, for matters before you in this paper. Um, I would also like to uh, table a letter of support that we've received from uh, Te Renaka or Waiho, which I believe has already been circulated. Right. Um, and I'll take the paper as read, um, but just noting um, some points around at the timing and appreciate the um, expediency of which this matter has been brought in front of you. Um, and I will open for any questions. Laura, well, thank you for that. Look, um, this, this is an opportunity now for councillors to be a bit more probing about this if they've got some concerns about the paper itself, the issues in the paper. Um, and that should be then set us up for a discussion once staff set back. So have we got councillors that want to make an inquiry on what's in the paper? Councillor East. <coughs> um, look, I wonder if I could just have a clarification. There seems to be some um, differing opinion from what we've heard from council for the uh, applicant around the um, um, I'll quote his letter, disappointed that they seem to have been the last to know about the council officers recommending um, this call-in process. Um, uh, and we're hearing earlier that uh, you say that we've had discussions with the applicant and it appears in the letter that they're somewhat surprised at that, that the uh, speed of our action and uh, short notice, so um, I'd just like some clarification around that. Thank you, Councillor East. Um, this proposal has been um, before Council um, for um, a number of months now. Um, it has been an active application for only a short period of time. Um, as you know, we were working through um, uh, the completeness of the application and had procedural matters with um, uh, with working out the um, getting the application in the door um, prior to the application coming in and being received. Um, there was a robust pre-application um, process with the applicant, and that was done in conjunction with both Waimati District Council and ourselves. Um, in that process, it was clearly outlined that um, this is a significant proposal and um, that as part of staff usual process with significant proposals, we do canvas um, the tools in the RMA that uh, provide for um, councils to call in 
So that was discussed early in the process. Um, I do acknowledge, however, that with the timing of us receiving a now complete application, um, that things have moved um, quickly. And there are several reasons for that around um, the applicant requesting public notification, um, timing of an upcoming election um, for central government, um, and our requirements to consider the um, community input into the application and the procedural um, approach that we are required to take for um, notification. Can I Came myself to you regarding the process that we need to go through for this, and we're always happy to have this discussion. We have decided that we would have this discussion at this meeting rather than, and we're always going to have it, uh, rather than call a special meeting to have this discussion, uh, you know, in a week or 10 days' time. So that's also um, added to that. So I'll put my hand up for that. I think that uh, we've got to where we are now. It doesn't change the facts that we have in front of us. So, Councillor Sunkel, have you got something? Just thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a question of clarity, uh, and notwithstanding the, the, I guess, our capacity of, of the workload, if we would progress this ourselves, and not, not a question on our capability, but, but the capacity. If we were to progress it ourselves and appoint hearing commissioners, what would be the difference in, I guess, their ability or capacity to make a decision as opposed to maybe a, a board of inquiry or, or the courts. And I, I just, you have this thing in my mind that we do have a responsibility and ability to to do these things. And I just, so my question is, yeah, what is that difference, I guess, between what or who we may be able to appoint if we proceed with the process against uh, the others? Um, with this process, um, if uh, council is in mind to request a call-in and the minister um, agrees that a call-in is appropriate, um, council would have the ability um, to input through the process into the commissioners um, that hear and decide the case. Um, we do that regularly um, now with the several of our other processes that we work through, such as the COVID-19 fast track, um, and the process around that for considering the appropriate um, expertise to put forward onto that, those panels um, would follow the same process that we use for um, any of our notified applications um, currently. However, it's us making a recommendation to um, the um, APA so that um, people who are running the process. Yeah, thank you, Council. Just, 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 just one follow-up, I guess, to my question to uh, uh, Christensen around, around the local, and I, I was thinking local can be devolved down and the hearing could be held in Waimati or wherever, if, if that was a space. Um, Council then suggested that the formality of some of those processes may be somewhat daunting to some coming in. Do we have a view in that space, just to, to help me in my thinking. Um, I do acknowledge that it is a more formal process than um, a standard um, publicly notified application process. That said, um, the ability for applicants to submit is the same as it would be for um, our usual process. Um, and we are aware that the um, size and significance of this proposal for the community um, for some is um, daunting in, in itself. And Council do have some non-statutory tools that we can use and have been used in the past around um, appointing independent uh, friends of submitters, for example, that can work um, independently of both councils to support submitters um, or would-be submitters through the process and detail what they need to do. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, um, as a follow-up from the last submitter uh, from Why Waste by Matty, who seemed to uh, support the call-in on the grounds that they opposed the application, can I get just re reassurance that your recommendation to the Council today to call in the uh, application 
is agnostic about the uh, likely success or failure of the application, but in fact is is premised around ensuring that the applica applicant has the hear uh, has the fairest and most robust hearing process to get the best outcome. Um, thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Yes, I can confirm that um, the decision before you was purely on um, the procedural approach for considering this application and is absolutely not on any of the merits of the proposal itself. Thank you, through you, Mr Chair. Just seeking some clarification around point 27 in our paper. You might just give a second to go to that, um, which is around the benefits to the Council of, um, be it probably EPA or maybe the maybe a, a board of inquiry i'm not quite sure but from account from the council perspective from the ecan organization perspective you suggest there there is some benefits of more technical expertise and resources generally does that mean we're actually almost acting like a submitter um, to the process i mean i'm just i'm having some difficulty understanding if we are providing planning advice and technical advice in that space, how does it tie in with the sentiment I'm sort of reading in that paragraph 27? Thanks, Councillor Mackay. We would still be following the same process and roles as we would if this was being dealt with by independent commissioners. So we're still the regulator. It's just we have access to more significant technical expertise and resources than we would having the um, appointed commissioners to determine the application. Look, let's be really clear. This organisation has the ability to do this. Uh, we're not saying that we don't have the ability to do this and we're passing the ball to someone else. This council has this ability. In fact, it's probably got more ability than most councils in New Zealand to do this. But I think you need to take into account uh, the, um, you know, the thresholds. And if, if you look at the thresholds, then there you can make your decision. Now, we've had uh, a paper that uh, talks about um, the thresholds, uh, and the thresholds are in this paper. And I would urge you uh, to consider those in your own mind about what they mean when you're making your decision. Because if you make a decision on anything else, it's not fair. And, and we should also be really clear that the consenting process is a natural justice process. Anyone can apply for a consent and they need to be heard, right? So we need to understand that. So um, I, I don't know if there's any more clarity sought on this. Uh, you do, uh, Councillor Krakow, where you go? I do not, Whip. Um, I, I just uh, a point of clarity. So going through the 11 points of the criteria, um, for the call-in, and um, also uh, noting um, if it's correct. So um, the Terunango Waiho letter um, was that received? When was it? Re was that received on the nineteenth? <laughs> was I believe it was Sunday night. So that actually answers the question around. Um, that answers the question around, um, you know, the sort of short time frame. Um, and the other part of it is that in the uh, the criteria for calling um, number eight, just to be clear, so the terms of section eight of the RMA, and we're actually talking about the section eight, which requires all persons ex exercising functions powers under the Act in relation to managing the use of development. And that is the Treaty of Waitangi Clause. Is that, is that correct? That's absolutely correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, just on um, under 27, paragraph 27, we, uh, sorry, 28, we talk about the risks, so looking at the risks of going for a call in. We say potentially less local input, influence, and understanding in decision making. And then um, the fourth bullet point, potential barriers of submitters and those are obviously something that I think we should really take very seriously. In 29 you speak to potential mitigations of those risks but it sounds like the mitigations are in the hands of the Environment Court so they can put something in place to support submitters but 
just how much influence do we have on that? What can we, what can we do? Or can we actually, you know, be very clear about what we, we do with that? Kia ora, Councillor Southworth. Um, this is the point that I raised earlier around um, non-statutory uh, tools that we can use regarding um, appointing an independent person to um, get over some of those barriers that might come up uh, with the community in terms of it being a more formal process. Um, and that's around uh, an independent um, friend of a submitter um, who can work on behalf of um, interested parties to provide that guidance that, that's required. Um, I believe there may be some tools um, or similar tools used through the court process as well. Um, but, but us as a council do have the ability to um, put that resource in place. Right, thank you. Um, one last, are we just about done, John? Thank you. Uh, just thinking about the processes again, if, if we were to uh, run the process ourselves, there's always the potential for judicial review or appeals to court. Is there a, a difference in what those appeals might look like if we call into a board of inquiry or, or through the courts as opposed to doing it ourselves? Are there different processes or reduced processes available for appeal? from the community or affected parties. Um, in terms of the first point of your question around differing um, appeals, um, not able to answer that. Um, not sure if there would be different things coming through um, depending on the process. Um, and in terms of uh, points of appeal, um, may not answer your question completely, but a, a point of clarification is that if this um, matter is called in, then any points of appeal are on points of law only as moving forward, as opposed to merit. Yeah. All right, thank you, Aurora. I think we've just about exhausted uh, the need to have you at the table, and thank you, Lee, and also Robin. So I'll ask you to step back. We've got um, four recommendations, uh, which we'll put up there. And if you need, they are in your papers, but if you need time to read those, I'm not going to read them. But essentially, I'd like to take those at a block and then have a move in a second, and then we can have that discussion that we need to have. And that discussion gives you the visibility of where you stand on this issue, which I think is really important for us today to do that. Uh, could I have a move at the end for those? Thank you, Genevieve. And a second, then. Thank you, Yayan. So therefore, we're going to move on a second. So therefore, we can now discuss this uh, this issue. Uh, we've, we've talked about um, the processes that we go through to get to our decision today, uh, your processes. Thanks, Joe. I'm just wondering procedurally whether we should amend it to remove paragraph four, just as Aurora noted that paragraph is no longer relevant. Got a legal view on that, Robin. It notes that that may happen, but we have been told it has happened, so do we need that in there? Through the chair, no, we don't need that paragraph there. Yeah, no, it can be deleted. I'll move an amendment to remove that paragraph. Thank you, Robin. The motion now is on the table. Sorry. Yes. I'm getting people waving at me because I'm not buttoning up. But uh, so um, my apologies for not going to Councillor Robinson and Councillor Cramble to make that amendment. That amendment has now been made and has been passed. Councillor Robinson is happy with that, and Councillor Cramble is happy with that. We now have the substantive motion in front of us, which is those three points. So now's your opportunity to speak to me. Oh, yes, Gen Genevieve, yeah, no, this procedural matter again. Um, I just want to thank the staff for making um, such a big effort with regards to um, this paper. Um, yeah, I strongly um, support the staff on this one uh, of calling it in. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Tato. As a second, Taitoko Ngakoruru here, Councillor Robinson. Um, I support uh, Councillor Robinson on this and thank the staff. 
um, for, for the paper and, and the work that's gone and and note that um, as we were told by staff earlier that you know uh, project care has been on the been on the council table and we've kind of heard um, you know a fair bit about this but also acknowledge today um, the two deputations um, to us and acknowledge you know, it's a significant issue for for um, for Waimati in the district down there and also note um, that the Waimati District Council have um, did vote yesterday for the call in of this application and also noting the letter that was tabled from Turunung or Waiho are supporting that as well and we heard from from Robert from down from the community in, in Waiho as well and so just taking all that into to, uh, consideration I will be um, supporting the call in. Kia ora. Yes, I, I too am supporting the um, call in process. Um, looking at the criteria, they're pretty significant, in my view, to New Zealand as a whole. Um, and also taking into consideration our, our own resourcing and things like that. But the Board of Inquiry, if that, if that is the, the way that the Minister wants to go, it has broad powers. Um, and the other the other issue for me is is given um, the um, presentation from from Robert Ireland, um, the item twelve um, suggests that the minister also has to consider the views of the applicant and the local authority. And I would presume that in terms of the local authority, that they would be conveying the voice of the public interest uh, in that in this uh, exercise. Thank you, Councillor Edge. Looking for, uh, we've had three people speak uh, for. Uh, looking for someone that might have another view here, uh, Councillor East and then Councillor Sunkel. Um, thank you. Um, I'm a little bit at odds with this um, proposal, uh, mainly from uh, a um, point of process. Uh, I have no objection to the applicants. Um, going to hearing, whether it's with us, the Board of Inquiry, or an environment court. Um, but I'm, I'm um, quite concerned, I suppose, about the, um, the timeline of this. And I'm probably just going to quote a bit of the letter that we've had from um, Mark Christensen. Um, and I agree that I find it's highly unusual for a recommendation to request a call in by the minister to be made at an early stage of the processing of this resource consent. And I feel that the applicant should have been uh, given the um, opportunity to discuss the possibility of the call in with the applicant. I've heard that the, the um, process the procedure was discussed in the early part of um, negotiations around this consent, um, but to throw it in at the last moment I think is, is a process that I'm, I'm struggling with a little bit. And I did make the, the point earlier um, around uh, reputational um, damage to ECAN, and I, I find that this particular um, process, the speed of it, it is really um, giving rise to a perception that um, we, we don't have the capa capacity or the ability to address this in, in a normal um, process. Now, I'm, I'm talking perception and um, and the other, the final thing that sort of concerns me uh, a little really is the uh, reality that if we agree to a call-in process and the hearing goes to a board of inquiry or in the environment court, the applicant is then um, reduced to uh, um, only being able to appeal on points of law. Um, whereas in the, um, if we we heard the, the uh, application, there are other avenues for them to pursue if things don't go their way. I'm not preempting any any decisions. Uh, I'm merely expressing my concerns around the um, the timing and the availability of the applicant to uh, engage 
in um, reasonable discussion around the process of call-in. So from that um, perspective, um, regrettably, I'm going to vote against the uh, resolution. Councillor East, uh, Councillor Sunkel. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I won't relitigate uh, the, the views of, of Councillor East, but they are concerns that they kind of roll through my, my mind as well. And I, I guess at the end of the day, I, I think I will reluctantly support the application purely based on the capacity of the organisation to process the work. I'm not sure that uh, some of the, the, the matters raised are really of such significance. Um, I look at the water use, and as is pointed out, it's sort of the same use as water as a dairy farm. So are we saying that every dairy farm would go to that? I'm being facetious. But if that's the value that people are putting on resource use and requiring call-ins, then, then I'll even challenge. So I'm challenged by the process, uh, but reluctantly supported based on the capacity of the organisation. Uh, kia ora. Uh, it's Tio Mana. So, um, uh, initially, um, there were concerns with me from um, the ECAN perspective around process capacity, um, but a lot of those have actually been answered now. Um, I come to also, um, you know, there's been a number of publicised uh, issues around communication with mana whenua. Um, I believe that those have actually been addressed. Um, and when I look at this letter, um, keeping in mind that um, this particular, um, the, the project here has been around for quite a number of months. And even looking at the letter from Tirunang or Waiho, is that um, they wrote an original letter back on the 11th of October, 2022. Um, and then thinking about um, what they've actually, um, they've quoted section eight of the RMA. But the important thing here for me is that it's not just Tirunanga or Waihau that is actually supporting um, a call-in. It's the other two Papatipa Runanga um, that believe that they were also going to be uh, affected. And particularly, we come back to the use of the water, the consents, the, that it's only part of it, and particularly around Mahinga Kai, um, which is all picked up very much in Section 8. So uh, I am now going to support um, a call-in. Thank you, Kilda. Uh, well, I, I, I will support the um, the, the call-in, but my, my the reason I'm supporting it is mainly around the the consistency of of moving forward and some um, uh, some certainty for the applicant. I, I believe. Uh, not so much around our capacity uh, to do the work, um, because I believe we do have some really good, and we've heard that um, that they, that can happen. But I think there needs to be some consistency to uh, to move this forward. I do I do have some concerns though. I do have concerns around the process um, after the fact and and the possibility of um, unintended consequences. Um, so from that point of view, you know, I think we need to be careful what we ask for. Um, but I will support it to move forward because I do think that the application needs to, to go forward because I do think there needs to be a resolution some way. Thank you very much. Um, I support very much what Councillor East um, spoke about. I, I have a lot of discomfort around the process here. I do feel if the applicant was given the half hour heads up, as um, we've been informed in the email, uh, that I feel doesn't fit with what our organisation, our, our organisation says we're going to treat people. So very disappointed in that. However, that obviously is, it, it's, well, it appears that that's what happened. Um, also share the same concerns about reputational risk and also setting precedents um, for future um, processes. I guess I'm just concerned too with the T, um, the Waiha letter that's been tabled in the paragraph that refers to the previous letter, 11th of October 2022, where it says the Runanga confirm, reconfirm that it supports the council's request for a call-in. 
so you know i just i have some what well, we've heard from staff this morning that that is, is often the case that um you know, of applications or, or um, some of our bigger applications uh, always have that as an option um i'm just a bit concerned about that so um i'm not quite sure which one i'm going to vote right at the moment look we've got uh uh council ward online so council ward if you could follow councillor mckenzie and then we'll go to uh councillor burns and councillor southworth uh, well, Mr. Chair, I, I think I, I think I came to this meeting uh, willing to uh, oppose the recommendation, um, but, but uh, and, and may, mainly because I was concerned that the applicant believes they weren't involved in the decision to call in. And, and we've heard two sides of the story. They've given half an hour's notice, and but they were in fact uh, it was part of the discussion with them all along. Um, I'm also concerned about our reputation as Claire and uh, David have. Um, enunciated, um, but I'm equally concerned about our capacity uh, to, to process other people's consents. Should we uh, process this consent application internally, and, and there's a fairness for both parties there. Uh, but I'm also reassured that this call-in process may well actually uh, be a fairer process for the applicant to discuss the merits or otherwise of their application and for the community to actually express their concerns about this application. And uh, and I think that last point to me, because there are some there are some big issues which actually goes to how New Zealand actually addresses its waste issues, which this application uh, might provide a solution or it might be uh, a rejected solution. But that is a significant discussion. And I think that discussion needs to be had at the highest level. And so for that reason, I think I will support the recommendation today. All right, so I'm well outside my standing orders here, but I think everyone needs to have a say on this. So the next uh, person is uh, Councillor Burn. Ah, uh, sorry, Councillor Ward. So Nick and Nick being uh, the councillor for that area. Nick, go to you. Um, yeah, from the onset, I mean, I've had um, mixed feelings, and I have, you know, um, expressed that around the council table. The fact that there is a large percentage of um, overseas ownership um i mean i do think we do need to look at other options to get rid of our waste um but then i do have a concern about that some of the information i've read that the, the machinery or the, the technology or the process they're going to use in this factory is sort of quite old and outdated and there are better better systems being used in other parts of the world um i mean there is you know and there's big issues around that but i mean um I think going forward, I mean, I do agree with what David and John and yeah. Ian. Yeah, that, can, I just, can, I, can I just say that uh, you're probably going into a bit of detail there in terms of technology, and we're not here to do that. So, just okay, so um, now. thank you. So, to, yeah, cut a long story short. Sorry about that. I um, I uh, do uh, support the, the um, um, yeah, the, the, the bringing in of this application. Thank you, uh, Councillor Burns. Kilda, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, both Mark and uh, online to uh, the um, Robert, added, uh, Robert for the added information uh, discussion. Um, my uh, comments are really about the um, comments that have been made previously about uh, the possible impact upon the reputation of ECAN. I would suggest to you that the impact upon the reputation of ECAN would be far uh, more uh, detrimental should we kick off the process ourselves and then decide at some other later date to call it in or request for the minister to call it in so just a thought the final comment now we're going to go to council southwest yeah yeah i um appreciate the additional information from um, robert online what the white hole letter and um from mark Christensen. and just my i have particular concern about the potential reduction in ability for locals to actually input, albeit that Waimati District Council, we know, have supported a call in. But I've heard I've been given confidence that we can that, that can be managed. And I haven't heard that there's a particular risk to the applicant either that this will be a fair process if it goes through call in. So I I see no reason to not support the call and I'm for 
Okay, thank you for that discussion uh, and and for the effort you put in there. Now, I would just like to just go back to the the three recommendations for the three notes online. You don't need to go through those. We have a mover by moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Cranwell. Any further discussion? Yeah. Councillor uh, Pauling, Peter. I see you've woken up in Brisbane. Thank you. Oh, I've been awake the whole time, mate. Um, hey. Thank you so much. Um, just waiting for the opportunity to speak to this one. Hey, I'm um, I'm satisfied that the the criteria has been um, been reached to to call this in. Well, to take that to the minister to for them to decide to call it in. So, um, and on that basis, that it's you know the decision hasn't actually been made. It's going to go to the minister to make that decision. Uh, I think it's the most prudent thing to do. Uh, looking at the criteria and the information we've been supplied. So. I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, so we have the motion there, but we have a mover and a seconder with a right of reply. So, Councillor Cranwell, anything more to say to that? Uh, just to just acknowledge that um, I this is an environmental and cultural issue. Um, I have 100% certainty that it went to uh, Environment Canterbury to uh, do the run the process of. Uh, um, uh, not calling it in and doing the resource consent, we have 100% capacity to undertake this work. So I, I take that uh, the capacity is not an issue, it is about environment and the cultural issues. Gilda. I've got not much to add to that, but yeah, I completely agree. I think it is, it's quite a big scope and um, it is sets precedent too, um, one of a kind and we need to get it right. Um, so yeah, I agree with what um, Councillor Bramwell just said. Thank you. Thank you. So I will now put uh, those three points uh, to you. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Uh, so we've got one no and an abstention. Do you want your, your, your opposition noted? I will note that, note that Councillor East has applied that. So that uh, that has passed, so thank you for that. So, um, Councillor Mackay, want her abstention. Just... You want to be you want to be mentioned that you're abstained, so that's fine. All right, then. Thank you for that. It was a reasonable discussion. Uh, I think what we now are going to do is go into public excluded. Uh, so we'll need to change screens. Uh, we can need to remove everybody from the room that doesn't need to be here, uh, and that we will we will. We will spend 40 minutes doing this and we'll take the 20 minute lunch break. Oh, sorry. Um, can I have a mover that we're going to so thank, moved by Councillor Krako, seconded by Councillor Cranwell. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. Yep, we have. Okay, we're ready to go. So thank you and th thanks for making the journey up here. I know you're under a bit of a time frame. You've got a two o'clock, so. If we can get going with, with you, Nigel. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, uh, Tia Scott. Uh, look, thank you, uh, Chair and Councillors. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to um, thank the Secretariat uh, who operate under ECAN, but uh, just do a fantastic job for uh, the mural forum. So we appreciate uh, your support uh, for that. Look, I'll just um, sort of skip through it. Uh, I'm sure you've sure you read the paper and we can go to questions at the end, but um, look, just in brief, uh, we've got the 11 councils of Canterbury. Uh, every three years, you, we do a, uh, we sign up to the tri triennial agreement, which would have signed off earlier in the year. Um, and back in January, we effectively refreshed the plan for Canterbury. So three years ago, we did a lot of work uh, and workshopped it and, and thought overall that it's uh, pretty good. Uh, but the learnings that uh, we thought we and that some of the things that we needed to change was the ability to be sort of more nimble and agile and focus the, on the on the here and now. Obviously, also looking at what the opportunities were in front of us, uh, and that was you know largely the election year. So to almost have a plan on a page, so we've got sort of really focused uh, priority areas. Um, so I'll go uh, to those priority areas. Um, Sustainable environment management of our habitats, uh, shared prosper prosperity for all our communities, and the third one being climate uh, change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, sitting under those, we've got three uh, priorities, uh, uh, further priorities that, and there's about nine um, in total, but um, some of the things that are really a focus for this year, and uh, you know, you can have some, uh, you know, a lot of 
sort of investment in this space as well. So uh, the first one being advocating with government for permanent co-investment and appreciate all the work uh, that you do in that space. Uh, but it's a key one for the mural forum and all councils across Canterbury to be really joined and aligned in this space. Uh, we've got to be conscious. And I know you're um, you know, setting a rate this afternoon, but um, you know, councils have to be aligned and joined up if we're wanting uh, you know, you to increase uh, rate funding, obviously uh, asking central government for uh, funding as well. In our own areas, we need to be supporting, uh, you know, ECAN increasing rates to support that, if that is what needs to be done. Um, so um, appreciate your work in that space. And look, there's some really good examples. I don't need to talk to this room. It's, um, you know, across the T TAs, the conversation is slightly different, but a lot of that work still hasn't been repaired to the uh, to where it needs to be. Um, and it's not just a repairing and stop that. So we know there's so many things around uh, resiliency, but there's some of that work that hasn't been done uh, looking back to you know, 2019, you know, which we had a, a flood that um, severed the South Island in two. Just wanted to actually step back and one of the key things that we look at when the you know chair and the mayors are meeting together is that it's very much around if it's good for one of us, it's good for all of us. And I really want to emphasize that point that it's really very much about leaving your uh, TA or your uh, ECAN hat uh, off outside the room. And we um, um, we challenge ourselves on that and very much look at uh, it being all of Canterbury conversation. And I think that's key. And that works really well when you're talking uh, with ministers as we did uh, recently to have that alignment. And we had really good feedback when we went to uh, Wellington a few weeks ago, probably a month ago now, uh, that Canterbury was one of the areas that was really aligned and, and um, it was uh, received uh, really well. And I think we've got a, um, a, a model that really works. Uh, second one, advocating for, with government for immigration and skills policy that works for Canterbury. Uh, we all know the challenges within, uh, uh, within our own uh, spaces and hopefully when MFE have done what they need to do, you might uh, have a little bit of um, reprieve in some of the planning spaces across uh, Canary, that would be lovely to see some of those staff coming back. Uh, but you know the uh, needs of a Christchurch Central versus a Mackenzie uh, that's you know uh, hot on tourism are quite different, and so we need those regional, sub-regional um, uh, uh, policies outside of that central um, immigration policy. And, and we are seeing those things relaxing, but we still need to put a real focus on that. Um, and the third one very much sits with ECAN as well, is seeking to collaborate and around uh, government funding uh, integrated pro uh, approach to transport uh, and also uh, roading uh, challenges. And we know there's um, you know, lots and lots of uh, challenges in that space. Um, look, so I know you've got lots going on today, so happy to go to uh, questions and uh, maybe they have a discussion on anything. Thank you. Yeah, hey, uh, this, is, this, is, this is cool and um, you know, a lot of, lot of um, sort of regional focus on that, which is awesome. but. Given the paper that was released this morning, I suppose, the future for local government, does that have much impact on, on this? And do you think there needs to be some focus around the, the governance, I suppose, and how, how our region is governed in, in, in this, or is it somewhere else? Um, I, I don't think it has any impact in the short term. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of water to go under the bridge, obviously, with conversation at the moment. And I guess the opportunity at the moment, and the, probably the key one, uh, you know, slightly off topic from Canterbury, but, you know, at the end of the day, the Mural Forum is an advocacy group for uh, Canterbury. But if we look at the opportunity, one of the key ones that came up, I know media will be talking about structural change because, uh, you know, that makes good stories, but uh, the funding was, uh, you know, touched on. And we all know that local governments, you know, underfunded. And some of those other things are gonna, we're going to work to over time, whether we support or don't. I think the key element from this conversation is that we have to pick, think past ourselves and, and look at what is, you know, whether it be structural or what have you, look past ourselves and see what is going to be best for our communities. But the key one that I'm trying to focus on myself at the moment is actually uh, funding. Uh, we need to have uh, funding from central government. And so uh, let's keep that conversation going right through to the election and past the election, um, because I know you've got the same challenges that we do. Can I just add, um, I mean, I've had some conversations with uh, Nigel about this, and I think that that's beautiful local government. And I think, the, and we have done it at the Mural Forum, actually, but it's 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 getting people to be 
uh, in a safe space that they can have that conversation to know that someone's not going to come and report them. Do yeah, you realise your mayor wants to sell you out? Because that's where it gets to, and it gets really tricky. But he's got good leadership in this. So, hey, who's next? Vicky. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this. I'm interested in, well, particularly the, the last of your priority actions around transport, um, tying back to the the key three at the top, we've got climate change mitigation and adaptation. So I'm just wondering why there's no mention here of decarbonising transport as part of that key. You know, I've looked and looked for something to do with emissions reduction, same in terms of the flood reduction and the like. You know, there's nothing referring to mitigation in terms of yeah, look, I think um, this is very much plan on a page, and, and so there's a lot more uh, further detail in that. So, yeah, definitely uh, no priority. Yeah. Another question around um, immigration. So, I obviously, you can perhaps hear that I'm an immigrant, so, so um, and hopefully bring some skills, but just I'm not sure that necessarily immigration automatically transitions into increasing GDP. And, um, and norm, I would have thought that was more around investing in new startups, uh, businesses that can flow out of the university, et cetera. So you, can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, look, I think uh, you're bang on. And the regard to immigration probably uh, addresses a short term need, uh, but there's, and so that's very much around the, you know, the current priority. And when I said about being more nimble and, and agile, and when we think, and that's probably one of the things that will probably come off this. So hopefully, with, you know, in some six months time, we'll, we'll be in a better position and actually maybe that's something else that will jump in there might be more of a focus around um, regional, sub-regional training, education, those sorts of things. So yeah, totally agree. But it's a, but it's a priority for now. And, you know, ho hopefully, uh, and you know, in a year's time, we'll be able to say actually we've, we've uh, gone a long way, and it looks uh, something different. Uh, you know, looks quite different. And we can raise something else. Just just a quick question. Um, thanks, thanks for that up update. Um, I look comparing what you're planning now with what was last June, and there's a good bit of consistency between that. Um, I presume. If this is just sort of a short document that the, the way that the previous document was structured in terms of those priorities, objectives, actions, monitoring that that will flow through. Um, yeah, yeah, very much so. I think this is the, the opportunity with this is this is uh, you know something you know even putting this in front of a minister, uh, this was too much for them to take away and read. <laughs> so. You know, you need short bullet points to get your point across, and that's, I think, what we're trying to get. There's a lot of that work that's going to be done behind the scenes in the Chief Executive Forum and, and those, you know, support in that space, but, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, that's right. I'm popping around the road to do it. Uh, uh, Chief, you shouldn't give me an opportunity, would I? <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's kind of not... It is, but it's not. So we're doing a review for it, uh, example, we're about to start on the regional biodiversity strategy. Um, and I'm just given the influence of the mural forum, both in developing it and, and the likes. That's the something that all the mural forum is committed to. Yeah, look, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So probably yeah. So one of the yeah. <laughs> Look, and uh, thank you. I think pretty much the closed questions. But look, thank you for the opportunity. And and I think just the key emphasis I want to get uh, across is that we are, you know, all, all fighting for uh, Canterbury. We won't always agree, and that's fantastic. And that's uh, democracy. Um, but we need to work closely together. The Bell Forum, um, you know, he can, you know, when Councillor uh, Scott and myself can go to Wellington, you know, joined and aligned, that's a lot more powerful. Um, and hopefully we can make some achievements. Uh, kia ora no, um, uh, Nigel, um, Paikikiti a koe. So you, you've seen what's on our on our wall here, and you had the uh, uh, the pleasure of having Tutahonuku come to you. I think your last last meeting. Uh, I think he might have given you a bit of a challenge as well, um, just on relationship with uh, uh, with Manafina and things. So how do you think uh, that was taken by the Bureau Forum? And I suppose. Looking, looking, future, and, yeah, looking at the future for local government report and ways of trying to um, working in partnership with Manafenua. How, how do you think that's going to go? Yeah, look, uh, even before uh, not came along, I think it's always been a priority for 
uh, you know, under our previous leadership, and the same goes now. Uh, previously, the mural forum um, leadership was uh, Sam, and I was the deputy. Uh, Sam Selwyn and I was the deputy chair, and I think that continues. So, no, no, definitely, I, I think we need to be aligned. And, and there again, it's the same thing. You know, when we're aligned and, and strong together, we'll achieve more for Canterbury and, and the, the wider region. Yeah, kia ora. So one of the things under your stewardship of the Bureau Forum that's become quite clear is the fact that we probably need to share more with stuff that's coming out here, which is regional with mayors. Uh, and the support and the resilience is just a classic example of that because the mayors have now written to ministers in support of what we're trying to do with resilience. Um, and to that end, it's really hard sometimes to understand what, what mayors find interesting other than, than parking and dog parks and stuff like that. But um, I, I think this mural forms in a good, a good space. I could, I could quote one of your councillors who used to put it down into about three or four sentences. What, what he did. Um, but I think we're in a good space. This mural forum. Look, and we've taken it on board. I certainly, I have about our comms to the mural forum needs to um, be a bit better than what it has. And to that end, we're we're going to set set up a, a we've set up a month a weekly meeting um, email with. Um, uh, the the, the Papatipa Rudunga chairs, and we want to do that. We don't want to actually bore you with this stuff, but we want to actually inform you probably once a month about the things that are going on in our background. And I think that will start the conversations that we need to have. I know um, that you're pretty well informed, but some of our other mayors are a bit more isolated and a bit more um, um, just busy doing the, the mahi to actually concentrate on some of those wider issues. So can I thank you for coming, Nigel? Uh, and can I just put the recommendation that we have in front of us? Unless there's any more questions. All right. Okay. The recommendation that we have here is that we receive the Canterbury Mayoral Forums Plan for Canterbury 22 uh, 25. Uh, thank you, Joe, for moving that. And thank you, Grant, for seconding that. But all those in favour, please say aye. And all those against, carry. And I'm sure this is a, a moving target, Nigel. There'll be plenty more conversations after this report that we received uh, today. So thank you. Right, Council, we're going to circle back now to the start of the meeting and we're going back to seven. So we'll do these um, issues around the minutes. Um, so item seven is unconfirmed minutes. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. And unless there's any matters of accuracy, we can take those as, as required. Do you have a matter of accuracy, Joe? Did you? Yes, thank you. But it's been. Yes. Yep. Is everyone happy with that? I might look for you to move that in. Joe, are you happy to move that? And happy to second it. Uh, I'll let you get your heads around it, right? Just need a moment. Thank you, Grant. Any discussion? There being no discussion, uh, can I put that to you? Moved by Councillor Davies, seconded by Councillor Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. Um, thank you, uh, Catherine. Is Catherine here? Catherine McMillan? She's not a runner us. Um, so we'll go to 8.1. So we've had, we've jumped around a bit on this agenda and people have got things to do, I guess. This is pretty straightforward. Um, again, 8.1. Um, any questions of clarification? I think we could. Possibly handle those internally. There don't seem to be any. Goes to the recommendation. There she is. How are you been, Catherine? No, Catherine, look, we've just we've just gone back to the start of the agenda and we've worked our way through. We're at this thing here. There's no discussion on it from councillors. We have a mover, which is moved by Councillor Burns. And seconded by Councillor Swiggs. Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, uh, that's carried. Previous com uh, committee activities and minutes. And again, Catherine, you're here to introduce this. Uh, so I'll allow you to sit up this time, Catherine. We'll get you to sit up. And um, this is the opportunity for um, the people who represent you on these committees to. Um, give you a background and fill in on um, what happened at those meetings because the both of these that are in there are meetings that um, 
uh, some of your councils represent. So I think probably, Peter, if I could just hand back to you, if um, there's the Canterbury Regional Transport and there's um, Audit Finance and Risk from memory on there, if I hand back to you and you might like to ask those people if you would choose to. Thank you. I'm happy to speak to that, although I don't know if there's anything startling comes out of that. It's just really reporting on the activities. What, yeah, has anybody got a question on that? We're more than happy to try to have a crack at answering it. But um, if not, we can move to you, Grant, with the with the other committee uh, feedback. Okay, thanks, G. Just just a few items on on that meeting on the seventh um, of June. Uh, item four. Uh, page 43, the Bangkok Treasury Services. Um, that, the report for that is also on page 46 of this of this agenda. People want to have a read of it. Basically, they flagged the volatility of the global interest rates and efforts to reduce inflation. And at the end of March, um, ECAN had 75 million of debt funded by the local government funding authority. And the cost of debt to us is now about 3.91% which is lower than many of the uh, local government agencies. Um, investment is compliant with our treasury policy and overall our debt ratio to income is low and we have headroom for asset management opportunities. In terms of um, item 8.5 on page 44 of the multi-year asset plan, we had a presentation and discussion about improving asset management and funding and reporting across the organisation and uh, in terms of aligning the plan with the procurement process and further discussions will, will take place as part of the LTP process um, in terms of perhaps uh, definitions, um, capital assets, those sorts of things. Um, in terms of 8.6, Audit New Zealand, and that's um, page 44, item 8.6, and that Audit New Zealand audit plan is on page 63 of the agenda. Uh, that was presented um, and uh, proposed timelines were given to us. And key fo some key focus areas were also identified. And if, if councillors want to go to page 74 of the agenda, you'll see a list of um, key areas that the auditor um, may wish to look at in terms of uh, level of services and the materiality of those and how we how we deal with those. Um, and and also uh, prioritising um, higher risk work such as valuation for forestry assets, property, plant and equipment. But overall, um, yeah, it was all it was a good meeting, and we covered a lot of ground. Thank you, Grant. Any questions of Grant about that? I think it's pretty detailed, um, and it's good um, summation of what was going on there. If there aren't any questions, we'll go to the recommendation which is on the screen and I'll be looking for someone to move that grant and seconded by Councillor East. Any discussion about that? Being no discussion I'll put that matter to you. Moved by Councillor East, seconded by Councillor East. All those in favour please say aye. Those against? As that's carried. Now we jump to 8.4 which is possums. I mean, sorry, possum tracks. <laughs> now, I'm not too. Have we got staff in here? We're going to have Carl or Lee or someone. Lee, you're there. Do you need Carl? Do you need Carl down? He's online. Oh, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll take the paper as um, read. You have had a, a briefing on this one. Um, just highlight some key points um, that staff have undertaken an analysis of the potential options as outlined in the paper. Um, these options range, range from $10 million to $15 million approximately of unbudgeted funds. Um, the analysis indicates the costs are likely to significantly outweigh the benefits of doing this. Um, and the report also outlines Environment Canterbury's um, existing investment in biosecurity pest management actions and just highlighting the third recommendation that staff recommend not progressing with this initiative. You didn't want to ask one. Anybody got a clarification issue for Lee? 
or Carl. Thank you, Lee. You can leave. This is pretty straightforward and a hangover uh, that we ever um, got to in the last triennium. So we're just really uh, procedurally tidying this up. And the recommendation is on the screen in front of you. So I need somebody to move that. Thank you, Greg. And I need a second. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, would you like to speak to that, Greg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think uh, the best way to um, cover this is to say that it's certainly well intentioned, but I think uh, on the key point that um, the costs are likely to significantly outweigh the benefits is uh, holds true. No, I just agree with what um, Councillor Byrne says, and um, yeah, there's a there's similar initiatives in place already, and I just think it's just a lot of money. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say it is coming from a good place and specifically looking at native biodiversity and native forests. And this was a proposal in order to do more for that. And I know we've raised before concerns that I hear from some of my constituents and groups that work on biodiversity, that we have a more focus on S from a product production point of view than a biodiversity point of view. And I am hearing that we're going to be looking into that. I am confident that we will, but I just want to have this opportunity to reiterate the fact that we absolutely have to get on top of pests that are impacting on biodiversity. Yeah, I think that's echoed by what um, Councillor Burns has said, and I think this is a, a really um, quite a good response from staff to this report because it actually lays out what costs will be if we're going to get into this sort of deal. No one's arguing that the work doesn't need to be done, but it's just the impulse lately. So I'm not too sure if we need any further discussion on that, councillors. OK, so uh, moved by Councillor Burns, seconded by Councillor Robinson. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, and that is carried. So thank you very much. Now we were going on 8.5, so going to 8.5. Which is decision of government budget 2023 fierce concessions. Stuart um, is going to do that. And are you part of this, Giles, or are you? Thanks, Stuart. When you're ready, Stuart, we'll just go into it. Okay, so, uh, so on May the 18th, part of budget 2023, government announced a range of national fair concessions for public transport, and these concessions are intended to enable more equitable access to public transport, to contribute to reducing transport emissions, and to encourage long-term behaviour change in young people in Aotearoa. Um, the implementation of these concessions is intended to coincide with the discontinuation of the 50% fares that's been in place to date. It's important to note that legislation uh, at the moment gives the right to set fair policy to the public transport authorities, not, not to central government. And so in the announcements for the budget uh, and the papers that followed to staff of PTAs, it was made clear that the decision to implement these concessions has been passed to public transport authorities on an opt-in basis. So what that means is public transport authorities have the, have the right to decide to implement or not implement these concessions. Uh, as Council knows, Council has already approved the implementation of a universal flat fare trial commencing on the 1st of July. Um, and we are um, investing a lot of time in getting ready to implement that uh, on the 1st of July. It's useful to note that the um, objectives of what government announced in their budget align very well with the objectives that Council have or had for the fair trial that they approved. However, as Council knows, our ticketing system has somewhat limited capabilities, and so in its current state, we are unable to implement all of the concessions uh, requested by government on the 1st of July. Uh, this is because our ticketing system accommodates only one age boundary within it, Government's uh, session announcement requires three age boundaries to accommodate all the ranges of options that they have put forward. This adds complexity to the ticketing environment 
at a time where council decided they wanted to simplify our fares structure to remove barriers of entry. Uh, so we are recommending a phased implementation which aligns with the advice we've been given from government agencies to enable us the time to investigate how we can change our ticketing environment to accommodate all of the concessions that government have proposed. Um, so on the 1st of July, some of these concessions will be implemented, but it is worth noting that the under 13 free concession will not be available on the 1st of July. Um, through our engagements with government agencies to gain clarity around the scope and the rules for the delivery of these concessions, we have had confirmation of the following. There is an expectation that an appropriate concessions eligibility validation process is in place so that the concessions are consumed by the right people in the community. We already have a process for our existing fares policy that requires age validation and verification to access age-based concessions. And we've been advised that our current process uh, meets the requirements of government. Secondly, drivers are not required or expected to conduct the age valid validation testing on bus. This is an impractical solution, which is well understood by government uh, and creates potential safety issues for our drivers. Uh, and so we are in strong agreement with not asking our drivers to take that task on. Uh, finally, the concession needs to be applied to the equivalent single uh, electronic fare trip. Uh, to translate that, that means it needs to be applied using a metro card, uh, which means the concessions will not be available for cash fares. Cash fares have no mechanism of age validation other than the driver. And as we've already stated, the drivers will not be conducting that task. So we expect some challenges uh, in terms of delivering some of these concessions, in particular the under 13 free, as I mentioned. Technology doesn't allow us to do that at the moment. The most recent update we've received from our vendor is very promising, however. Uh, they believe that they can modify our ticketing system to accommodate the three age boundaries that we are required to have and that we hope to be able to deliver the under 13 free uh, in August at the earliest, so that's a month away. When we do deliver that change, uh, we do anticipate some challenges with some of our customers expecting to ride the bus for free without presenting a metro card. And so we will have to carefully manage and monitor that behaviour. Um, Timaru is slightly different, as you know, we run the on-demand MyWay service down there, and that is a consumption-based model, which we've talked about in a range of briefings. And so we are concerned about the negative impact that these concessions may have on the service delivery of on-demand in Timaru. Notwithstanding that, we do believe there's an opportunity to accommodate uh, some level of concession opportunity for the Timaru community. And so we're proposing to continue to proceed with the community services card concession, which we've already planned to implement, but also introduce a concession for the 19 to 24 year old cohort so that they pay the equivalent child fare in Timaru that represents a 40% concession. The reason we recommend that is we've done some analysis of usage of My Way in Timaru, and we don't believe that that, that concession option will have a material impact on the service outcomes. Both of those concession options will be funded by government. Uh, we're also investigating whether it's possible for us to implement the under 13s free and the 50% concession for 13 to 18 year olds on our school services in Timaru. We will obviously be implementing those in Christchurch on our school services once our ticketing system is unable to do it. And we see no valid reason not to apply that in Timaru as well. That does require a change to our ticketing system. Um, I'd like to bring the Council's attention to a range of risks in the paper, most notably uh, the potential of increase in antisocial behaviour. Uh, we note that in Tauranga and the Waikato, they have implemented free 
transport for children in the past and have experienced a range of antisocial behaviour increases. And secondly, there is no funding announced in the budget to accommodate uh, responding to increased demand on our network, or in fact any network in Aotearoa. Um, so uh, Council will need to consider that, I suspect, as part of your long-term plan process once we see the impacts of the fair changes. Uh, mind you, that is a good problem to have uh, over demand. Finally, uh, when, when the time's appropriate, staff would like to propose an amendment to the recommendations in the paper. We've recently been advised that we're required to sign a memorandum of agreement with Wakakotahi to access the Crown funding for these initiatives. And so we're pushing to propose a new recommendation that delegates that authority to our Chief Executive. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, that was going to be my point. So these recommendations will lead to that. That will be in Stephanie's hands uh, in terms of the advice received through Giles and yourself about how we go about that. But um, a major step for us, I guess, in terms of putting this in place um, and just really thank you for uh, what you've done here because it's a bit of work trying to nut your way through this. We really are aware, I think, about the vulnerability of especially, um, you know, pre Free, free fares, and we really are concerned, I guess, about, or I am concerned anyway, about uh, drivers. I think the more we can do to take the decision process out of drivers about, um, you know, eligibility better, uh, because they should be just driving buses actually and doing service delivery. Questions? Sure. Stay on. This is still going to be two years, is that right? The Government announcements have no end date for the, for the national concessions. The trial that we're about to start has a period of maximum of two years. So just to clarify, um, the universal flat fare component of, of our trial will start in July and run for a maximum of two years. The concessions announced by government, which we will be implementing, have no end date. Just to clarify, I think you might have said exactly this, but just to confirm, if we're like with looking at the under 13 zero, if when we can put that in place, it will be specifically with the use of a metro card, which is great. I think a lot of parents would feel very much happy about that as well. To be honest, she's just reconfirming. What Does it saying. matter that I missed? No, that's good. Think about something completely different. Sorry, my apologies. Mm -hmm. My apologies to you for that. Look, I think you can step back, Stuart and, and, and Giles. I'll tell you what I was thinking about later, but I'm not going to say it. It's not appropriate. Um, all right, so the recommendations to go ahead with this piece of, uh, implement this piece of work are there in front of us, and noting that five is there, which is the, to create that opportunity for, which is in read there, delegates to the Chief Executive Authority to exec execute uh, relevant agreements to support, enable and deliver the government's fair concessions approved by Council. Everyone happy? Everyone's happy. Mover, Vicky, seconder, Dion. Missed you, John. Sorry about that. So any further discussion on this, John? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I know at times it goes against my my conservative rural background, but I'm pleased to see that we have reached this point in the process, having given uh, a commitment to the community to to proceed with this and trial it, uh, in the expectation that we will gain data and I guess opportunities from it. So I just I thank uh, Council for reaching the point that we have and a continuation. I know we're in flux. There's all manners of things thrown at us. But pleased to see us progress with this. Thank you. And again, I've missed you, uh, Councillor Southworth, as the mover on this. But if you're happy, we'll move to you at the end and you can summarise if you like. Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank the team for this bit of work. It's been going on for a while. Um, the the councillors in, in the last term uh, spent a lot of time getting, getting this through um, with the community backing. And um, yeah, I'm pleased to see this finally come to fruition, so it's great. This. Becky, just you, Becky. 
your button be? Oh, it was on. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to see this. It's been a lot, quite a journey, and and it does show what we can do when, as a whole table, we can work together. We support staff. Staff come up with great proposals, and it, and it, it, I'm really excited to see how it goes. It is a uh, a good problem to have if we have more demand. That is the whole point of doing this. It's the government's point of subsidising fares, et cetera, et cetera, is to have more passengers, and then we can incrementally increase our services, and that's fantastic. Um, and I'm really excited that we're also enabling the 19 to 24 year olds in Timaru because it really speaks to that idea that, and I think the research backs it, that when you enable or encourage younger people to use public transport, they become more frequent users through, through life. So it's growing a new generation of public transport users. So fantastic. Thank you very much. Nice to walk it. On the screen here, may I say, just before we uh, get to this, um, you're almost uh, achieved warrior status on this thing uh, since, since I've known you and you've kept pushing on it all the way through uh, and that tenacity has got a good result at the end of the day. It's a bit serendipitous in places, but um, you've never you've never backed off what you believe in. And so well done to you and the others that supported that also. And just noting that uh, Councillor Sunkel um, did propose free fares for everybody at one stage, so it's good to get to here. It's good to get to here, and hopefully we do get that, that problem that we get more people. So uh, that recommendation has been moved by Councillor Southworth and seconded by Councillor Swiggs. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. All those against, aye. I thank you, Craig. All those against, uh, that's carried. So thank you. Well done, uh, well done, Stuart, uh, for your work on this. Okay, hopefully it makes it maybe an easier space. I'm not, not sure about that. 8.6 is the submission on. Um, I've got someone that's talking at me. So Kate, Kate, do you want to come up? Okay, thank you. So um, Kate, and Jess, Jess too. So primarily, um, uh, you can handle this any way you like. Jess, whether you want to introduce it and then let Kate to speak to it, but it's um, it's it's a paper that's going to be represented by you, Kate. Through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, Kate Willem, I'm our senior strategy advisor in the climate change and community resilience team. Will um, mm -hmm. present the paper. We'll make it as read. I'll just get Kate to run through uh, the key points and the recommendations, and we'll take any questions from there. <laughs> thank you, Jesse, uh, and uh, thank you, councillors. So um, the title of this item is lengthy, but the decision that is needed is hopefully not. Um, this is a submission to the Climate Commission on their draft advice to the government on the second emissions reduction plan. Um, Thanks to councillors for their previous feedback, um, both during the briefing and as written feedback. Uh, we have now addressed that feedback within the final submission. Um, and the next step will be to uh, do the recommendations of um, approving the submission to lodge with the commission and delegating to the chief executive um, the authority to make any minor amendments to this submission. Um, just a quick overview of the key points in the submission. Um, as we uh, flagged up earlier, we are proposing that Environment Canterbury supports all of the recommendations in the advice, and we have made some additional recommendations to be included in that advice um, that reflect uh, Environment Canterbury's role as environmental steward for our region. Um, so we've asked for direction on emissions reduction to be appropriately reflected in the planning frameworks that are used by regional councils. Um, We've asked that where direct resourcing is provided to mana whenua, that this is flexible enough to meet um, the diversity of needs. 
um, we've asked that all government climate strategies, not just the equitable transition strategy, are equitable in particular for the most vulnerable communities. Um, we've asked that agricultural emissions are appropriately integrated with holistic on-farm decision making, especially for freshwater outcomes. Um, that we uh, received some more specific guidance on how to address climate change through the resource management planning system. Um, and some more clarity and direction around managing climate change uh, through local government finance and assets and through waste emissions. And also we're supporting the advice in there that's about um, the opportunities in the fire economy for capturing methane um, from biomass, biofuel, shed heat systems and food waste reduction. Thank you. Hey, uh, questions for Kate. Thank you, Claire. Mine might not be a question so much as a point I want to discuss. Um, thank you very much. I, I did get the opportunity to provide some feedback and I emailed in and said I would talk to this in the discussion point and I probably will leave that until it's motions moved and it may be more appropriate to leave this. But I think my, my concern is around point 37. Um, where we talk about supporting enabling agricultural emissions pricing system to recognise the broader um, emissions reducing practices and technologies is, is you know, we're, we're looking for more recommendations and obviously I think it's, it's around trees and vegetation and other sequestration there. What I am con feeling quite uncomfortable about is the fact that we've got involved, we note that increased modelling, co model complexity may increase the risk of participants gaming the system. I, I just, I feel it's quite sad that we sit here as an organisation and we can put that in a submission where we're not trusting anybody. I mean, the agricultural uh, people in the agricultural sector are no different in wider community and I just feel that this is focusing on an activity unfairly. Thank you. Leave that on the table, don't need to comment on that. So, no. Uh, point of clarification um, number two of the key submission points. Yep, um, so we're talking about Tariti partnerships. So, the Tutu Whenua entities are they the five trust entities? Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor, I'm unsure whether it is or not. Um, so we're going by the wording that was in the Commission itself. Yeah. Oh. I'm just wondering um, for me it is, and then there's the five uh, entities. Um, um, we can uh, clarify that if you would like, Councillor. Um, I don't have the information here. I do know that the phrase te ture whenua was the phrase that was used in the draft advice. But I don't know if it's dropped down to specify that it's those five entities. Other councillors? I think you can step back. Kate and Jessie, I think we're fine. There's no more clarification required. It's pretty good, straightforward answer. Good report, Kate. Um, you've done good. Well, I mean, you've covered all our bases like we, we do. So well done to you um, for doing this. Would someone like to move that motion there, please? Thank you, uh, Vicky, and seconded by Genevieve. Councillor Southwood, do you want to speak to that? Just oh, yeah, just it, I'm 
it's, it's great and quite detailed submission. There's obviously a lot of work gone into this. Councillors have all had a chance to input. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see some specific issues or opportunities that we you know, have identified that are um, Canterbury relevant. Um, good to see reference to interregional transport, for example. I think that's something that we um, know would be a really great opportunity to have greater amount of inter and intra regional public transport. Um, I think it is good and um, given the, um, the public forum topic that we had this morning about um, groundwater, fresh water and greenhouse gas emissions, there's, you know, that was, it's good to have that um, in here. Uh, and I'm also particularly around um, suggesting it for me, I think that the land advisory services support in uh, more environmentally sensitive and, and lower emissions farming practices, but that stand outside of environment Canterbury, I think that's actually and um, let's hope we get on with it and, and we get the support from the government to, to put this in place. Do you want to speak now or at the end? Um, so credit uh, Councillor McKenzie and then Councillor um, Sunkel. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I, I, I won't support uh, uh, the submission. And, uh, and, and in brief, I will explain why, really. And it comes down to point five on page 117, where it says gross emissions must be reduced for enduring climate change mitigation. And, when I, and, and to me, that this is a sort of an urban perspective, because almost all greenhouse gases that come from urban settings uh, to, uh, are gross emissions and net emissions. But when you go out into the countryside, uh, uh, we are blamed for a significant proportion of New Zealand's gross emissions. But when you actually then put add to the equation of the carbon dioxide we take out of the atmosphere, uh, most rural uh, operations are uh, in terms of net emissions and are very close to zero, if not above zero. And until we address those sorts of issues seriously from a a world and a New Zealand perspective, we're not going to make any difference to greenhouse gases because there's no mention of concrete in here. There's no mention of actually waste management other than claim, claim, trying to reclaim a little bit of methane back from a, um, a, a landfill dump. Um, you know, we have large, we have significant suggestions around land use change and uh, uh, enforcing compliance of agriculture, but none of that uh, imposed on urban uh, development and and when you read the articles about what's caused climate change around the world, and it's a global issue, it's almost all to do with urban development, and yet we barely touch on it in this report. So I can't support this submission. Thank you for that, Councillor Sunkel. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. And, and while I have significant sympathy with, with Councillor McKenzie's views, I, I, I will support it in a belief that we, we do need an integrated and holistic approach to agriculture, but I, I absolutely take his points on board. Um, I, and again, I um, point 37, uh, we note the increased model complexity may increase risk of participants gaming the system. We have a bit of a challenge in this organisation about uh, gold rushes and gaming and and all the work we do, I would love us as an organisation to concentrate on the outcomes and achieving, and I guess uh, enabling outcomes rather than concentrating at times on what someone might do in a corner, the, the squirrels that I talk about. And I, I just know it is a challenge to me that we, we have these squirrels that we concentrate on rather than looking at the big picture and going, if we could achieve 95% of it and some bugger gets something over there, well, we don't like it, but we've achieved 95%. Just how at times we, we, we do approach some of these things, but otherwise I, I will support. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm really supportive of, of the uh, submission. I think it's excellent, another excellent uh, work, bit of work by staff. Um, I, I picked up, uh, we'll just, just mention a few things that I've picked up. and. One of them was uh, item six, uh, Canterbury's gross emissions are increasing and it's clear that the government needs to provide meaningful direction. So uh, that, that struck uh, a note with me. Um, and also um, 35, 36, um, where it talks about um, you know, recommending additional tools 
such as financial incentives for land retirement to help drive land use change and on-farm diversification. Um, and then finally, the word I really liked is item 34. We have recommended support and guidance to promote synergistic outcomes. Um, and I thought that sounded really good. Uh, and, I, and I'm optimistic that our integrated planning process and the holistic viewpoint with our partners will deliver many of these things that we're talking about in this submission. So I think we, we look, we're going down a, a really good um, pathway. Um, and, and in terms of um, the way we handle this, the Spatial Planning Act, I think, will provide the context for delivering these messages. Yeah, yeah I'm just wondering, hearing from Claire and John, whether they would like, I'm just wondering whether we should have a discussion about whether we slightly tweak the wording in that point 37 to just support enabling agricultural pricing emissions, blah, 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 and delete that final half of that sentence. We know that increased it or, or pop the word some, the risk of some participants gaming the system. And I think just to be just to say, you know, if you if you point a tax advisor, and I suspect, a, you know, an advisor that's working on your path, on climate emissions when we have pricing you know their role as a consultant is to minimize the customer's um ultimate cost but um that gaming the system's perhaps not a strong way of putting it so i just wonder is it worth us having a discussion around that look i'm not in favor of making any adjustment to this report but if my councillors think that that's a requirement then we'll do that but i mean people are saying what they think we're at either end of the continuum here and it's good debate to have uh, I'll go to Councillor Karaho. Tēnā koe te mana. Look, I've, I've got um, some sympathy also for Councillor McKenzie and what uh, he was saying, particularly within bearing the urban to uh, rural. Um, so I'll just put that there. But um, one thing that um, I find a lot of positiveness in this, particularly around the Tiriti Partnership, and then ensuring the flexibility and the protection of Matauraka, which is actually the whole uh, a big part um, of um, you know how we exist in some ways. The thing I like is that is also that um, Environment Canterbury have been very clear about um, the fact is that they don't represent Mana Whenua, um, but to me. Um, and, and actually ensuring that there's direct engagement by the Commission. Um, my other question that I had before in regards to um, the Tūru Whenua. So I would think reading this uh, in the context, it is the Tūru Whenua Māori Land Act. And one of the important things is that um, it, continually needs, it continually needs to be highlighted around um, the challenges that Māori have on Māori land. And particularly around multiple ownership, multiple ownership, and a lot of that actually around how difficult it is to get finance. Um, you know how difficult um, it is to actually try and defend the fact that if it's not being used, it's not rated. Um, so a lot of that is actually tied up into that, and that um, part 29 um, of what I'm talking about. Actually, I think articulates it really well. So um, I'm in support uh, because of those factors that in some ways I'm sitting here actually representing those that actually believe that this is actually the right way forward. Thanks very much through you, Chair. Look, I, would, um, I do appreciate the offer that Councillor Southwest put on the table. Um, I don't know whether it's worth dying in the ditch, but I just would like perhaps staff and others to hear the call. <laughs> Probably going to have to say again. I just, um, I do acknowledge and thank Council of Chair is not keen, and look, I'm not going to die in the ditch over it either. Um, but I just want staff and others to hear our concern about being treated equally with other members of society, I guess. Slightly different words that time around, but I just on I want to put on the table my own personal um, greenhouse gases for a, a dairy farm 
and since 2016 to 2023, so this is the year that's just finished, as of um, first of July, no, first of June, first of June for us, um, I've had nearly 15% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions on the property, and uh, that was largely due to a considerable investment, many million, probably three and a half million dollars worth of investment uh, over that time. I just done the numbers on my farm 2016 to 2023, a 17% reduction. So uh, I think as an industry, everyone is moving towards and our uh, requirements by 2020, um, 2030, we're meeting them. So there's a lot of work going on and a lot happening in the space. Hey, thank you for that. Look, um, it's, <clears throat> as I said before, that's um, a pretty wide view of life, uh, which is good. It's really good to have those views. Take on board your point. Uh, Councillor Mackay, and I'm sure that the people that write reports are listening to you, um, and uh, we'll take that into account uh, when when we get through this. Councillor Southworth, I'm go back to Councillor Robinson first. If you want to say Councillor Robinson, that's the seconder here. I just really appreciate the report and the discussion around it, and. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that have been um, taken into account as well, such as like food wastage and food production and biomass and um, the like. And I just, yeah, just want to appreciate the efforts gone into this. Thank you very much. No, I've got no more to say. It's a good, good report. Let's move on. Thank you. So we'll put that motion to the table. Uh, moved by Councillor Southworth, seconded by Councillor Robinson. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against? Against or abstaining? Against. And David, do you want that noted? Noted? Yeah, noted. Okay, so you're abstaining. Thank you. So that motion has passed. Thank you. And now we've. Giles. Giles, we're going to move to 8.8 .8, the adoption of the annual plan. Uh, probably the biggest thing that we do this year and then following on from that eight point nine what's the right one what's the right one yeah sorry i see we've got a hand up i can't see a name associated is that you craig yeah it's me peter i just wanted to uh let everyone know that i have to leave shortly but i'm keen to stay on for this next paper if i can and then i'll i'll head off so thank you for everybody good thank you all right giles handing over to you uh thank you chair take the paper as read just a few summary comments um Councillor will be aware that the draft annual plan for 23-24 was prepared in the context of significant increase in pressures on the council's ability to fund and financial position in terms of the economic circumstances the country and the organisation faces, but also with a commitment, commitment to stay within the projected increase of 10% in terms of the overall rating impact on the community but also with a clear desire to maintain the commitments that had pre previously been made in the long-term plan 21-31, but also the annual plan that was approved last year, 22-23. So Council went out for engagement with no uh, proposed changes in the annual plan to the community. Important to highlight that last year, a number of changes were identified impacting the annual plan for the coming financial year, which included commitments to a public <laughs> Uh, public transport fair trial, that's just, um, just debated and discussed on a previous agenda item, and a number of other public transport improvements, fund, fund, flood recovery funding, and the replenishment of general reserves. As a result of the ongoing financial pressures, staff undertook a review of existing commitments to identify where additional, additional savings could be made without impacting on the achievement of level of levels of service or the overall commitments that the organisation had made to deliver services to the community. That resulted in approximately $4 million worth of uh, uh, funds being able to be identified to be reprioritised to further offset cost pressures that we, uh, that we face as a council. 
So although those changes have been made, it's important to highlight to councillors that the organisation does go into the next financial year facing significant financial pressures and significant financial risks, which we believe as a management team with the support from council that we can manage effectively during the year as we prepare the long-term plan for uh, uh, the next financial year. I'm happy to take any points of clarification or Carmen can help me. <laughs> Through you, Chair. Thank you um, for that, Joss. Just, just a point of clarification, and I'm well aware that the rates take we're collecting has not changed, but um, we went out saying that we were going to spend 270 mil. We're now in the new draft, currently 280 mil. It's it's how it's yes, Brian's in the room. <laughs> it's how it, I, I'm just inquiring about how you've dealt with the reprioritisation funds in, in the regional leadership portfolio. Well, what does it effectively mean? I've tried to make sense of the cash flow and all that stuff. And <laughs> um, Essentially, that money has just been put aside in a pool to be used at a time when uh, obviously we get squeezed from for various pressures at this point, but it is actually built into the budget as it stands. Supplementary then. So as in my understanding is that it, it's effectively like a reserve, acting like a reserve, some of it which obviously we will have to borrow because our reserve situation is not looking to improve very much during the year, um, when in fact we know that we had already anticipated collecting another two and a half mil. So it's effectively, that's how it's worked. Essentially, it's it's parked in the current year. The reserves tend to be multi-year, longer term things, but it does operate basically like that. Yes, we can dip into it when we need to. Just from a comms point of view, when we uh, put this out, when it all gets through, um, it might be quite helpful because people can look at that and it's a huge increase in that particular portfolio without perhaps much explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Any further clarity from uh, Giles or Brian? Pretty keen to get the recommendation up so we can have a decent discussion about that. So we might do that. And I'll go to uh, Bova who will be Grant and a seconder who will be John. Um, I've manufactured that because they are the two key people in audit, finance and risk, and they carry this responsibility with them. So would you like to speak now, uh, Grant, or hold off? I just, just speak briefly now, possibly um, comment at the end. Thank you. I'm really just picking up on, on the comments from, from Giles explaining the sort of the journey that we've gone through um, from from last year and um, in, in proposing the 10 percent it was really based on uh, New Zealand's situation uh, related to inflation interest rates and the concern for uh, the public in general about the state of the economy and we thought to be responsible that we actually um, consider trying to hold the line. Um, and the, as Joel says, the 10% the was based on a 4.6% that was uh, indicated in the year three. Um, and then as a result of uh, issues related to the fair trial, and the flooding issue, as well as the undertaking to replenish the general reserves, that took it up to 10%. So that was the starting starting point. Um, and as a result of that, um, uh, we then had uh, public engagement, and we had about 170 people um, submitting to us. And of those, um, over 70% seemed to be uh, reasonably in support of the uh, of of the proposed plan, um, 
there were also people who were concerned about affordability. So that's still in the back of our minds. Um, and between February the 15th and our deliberations, other things changed and the pressures of um, various items uh, were known to us and staff then worked through various worked through the various portfolios and budgets and had had to effectively to retain the 10 percent um, find some savings and some reprioritizations to the tune of about four million and they have done that and um, even though uh, during the deliberations there was um, you know some thoughts from some um, councillors that you know could we um, uh, spend a bit more. Um, uh, that wasn't to be the case. Um, and and really, the understanding that even though things are reprioritized, the levels of service um, in, in dealing with the future have have been um, maintained or will be maintained. So that's 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 quite good. So we just it's really a, an adjustment situation. Um, and and I, I think that uh, this annual plan that we're we're about to approve, hopefully, um, it, it's done so with good intent, even though we know what's coming in terms of further pressures this year as well. Um, we are a little bit on the back foot, um, but the only way out of it is uh, asking our ratepayers for more. Uh, and more, and more, um, and so that will be something that we'll have to consider later date. Very briefly, <clears throat> and, uh, and I guess in seconding this, I, I thank our staff and the organisation for achieving the outcome that we have. We, we set a benchmark of 10%, as, as the Chair of Audit and Risk has highlighted, inflation has taken us over. Uh, floods, uh, government mandates, unfunded, all the things that come at us. Uh, public transport have created real tension within the building and our requirements. And so to be able to, to hold at 10% and reprioritise, I genuinely thank our finance team and staff for it. And I echo uh, Councillor uh, Edge's comment that what is coming at us is a bit of a tsunami. So the 10% we have today is going to create some real challenges as we look at our budgets going forward. Uh, with what we will be required to do, uh, <clears throat> and that's not looking at what we might do. So thank you again to the staff for landing us where we have. For some of us, it's always too much, but I think it's been a great job to get to the point we have. Thank you. Cool. We'll go to you, Craig. Um, you're under time pressure, but we'll go to you. Oh, kia ora, everybody. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge all the work that's been done on this, as noted by John and Grant. and. Um, yeah, just to say I'll really support where we've got to. Uh, in particular, really excited about our fair trial. Uh, we've had a few other decisions around that today. Um, so that the work we've done on public transport has been acknowledged, and that's an exciting thing in this annual plan. And I'm also specifically really happy that uh, Murudako, um is still there, and uh, we didn't have to cut that budget uh, any further. So I'm um, looking forward to working on that as well as other things to do with our biosecurity and biodiversity uh, and public transport uh, and our planning regime going forward for the long-term plan. So uh, thank you, everybody. Kia ora. Yeah, kia ora, Craig. Uh, Claire. Thank you, um, 3HU. I'm by myself, I think, I needed to probably go back and check before I thought of it thought about what I was going to say, but I think this might be the first one I'm actually going to support in my term at council, while somebody's shaking their head at me. Um, look, and, and I acknowledge um, particularly the difficulty of some of the decisions that we've had to make as a council table, and really do appreciate the work that staff have actually done to get us, to, to, to hold us at a 10%, at a given the inflation rate, you know, in the context of, of the, um, the world that we actually have to live and work in. Um, so I'm going to be pretty brief, really, and, and just say that um, I really do acknowledge that the difficult time, the decisions that we made 
of the 10% were made in the previous term of council. Um, that was a council decision. I've got to, I look by that. Didn't support it at the time, but it is what it is, and I will be supporting this uh, to go through. Thank you. We'll go to Texas. Councillor Ward. Hey there, Nick. He was, he was there. Look, let, let's move on. Um, look, until you put your hand up, because there's a hand up. Councillor Crackle. Uh, kia ora, uh, te tīmana. Uh, kei te pirangi uh, o ki te mihi uh, ki a mātou kaimahi. Um, me o kuhoa e kai kaunihira uh, mō rātou mahi me te uh, nui nā o mātou kau tu reiti i tautoko i te nui nā i tautoko i tā mātou mahere atau. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, our staff um, and my fellow councillors um, for their work and most of all our ratepayers actually who uh, mostly supported um, this annual plan. And I, I just acknowledge too because it, there's been um, you know, a lot of work done at the table with um, us councillors and um, you know, passionate pleas for, um, for think, good things actually, but at least um, we we're able to hold the line um, and keep um, it to the 10 per cent. And then when I think about um, our staff and particularly the cost pressures of the organisation, you know, what that's carrying, um, balancing rates, affordability for the community versus um, the need for action around um, climate change and to protect the environment. That's what we're here for. Um, I think the other part of it, though, is that 76% of our respondents were broadly supportive, um, which which is actually a testament, actually, to the work that's been done by our staff and also our councillors. I think so. Um, without any further to do, I uh, I total for this and support it. Kia ora. Okay, Councillor Ward, uh, we'll try you again. Can Can you sure. hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry about sorry about that. Um. Yeah, I, I I totally support it, and I just echo what um, um, Counts Caraco, uh, Suckle, um, Kai, and um, each have said today. I mean, I do. I you know, like everyone else, I am concerned about the rising costs, and and the um, but I, I really appreciate all the work that the staff and and other uh, councils have put into this plan, and and for that reason, oh, I'm 100% supportive, and I might actually. Say good night now and head off to bed because it's uh, half past three. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, happy that everyone has a comment on this if they've got one, but we are uh, fully supportive by the sound things. Councillor Southworth. Put my hand up before. But, um, yeah, just it is a huge piece of work, and it's and I and I also see this very much as a stepping stone towards the next long term plan. Um, I do know the. the I, we have some properties that are going to get a discount this year, others actually quite a bit more than 10% rise. So there, there is a real, to me, and to me, the risk around not communicating really well how those variations work and arise is that we can have, particularly where we have large events like floods come through, can it, by holding on to this average notion, we risk being unable or having to cut back on good parts of work programs that we have in place in order to respond to uh, an unexpected event, which we're realistically going to get more of those. And so to get in, um, you know, more smart around how we communicate those types of things is really important, but I'm sure we'll get to that through the, for the next long term plan. Um, and also just, you know, a, an, I'll note a, a disappointment around um, the biodiversity side of things with the uh, Community fund and 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 also Meruraku, which as Councillor Pauling pointed out, yes, it's held a line this year from what it was proposed to be last year, but it is nevertheless quite a bit of cut back from what was proposed in the long term plan, and it just feels like biodiversity is always the go to to keep cutting down on, um, and yet we know it's so important that we enhance not just hold a line but actually regenerate our native biodiversity. So um, hopefully we can do more for our long term plan. Thank you. Yeah, we'll note that and hopefully um, 
we'll get the minutes to res reflect the range of views that we have and the pressures that are there. Uh, we'll note that. We'll note those things uh, and we'll note that also because I think that's uh, relevant to the discussion that's got us to where we are today. Uh, and this is, you know, it's, it's, it will signal way back in the LTP, but it's still a discussion that needs to be had. And I'd just like to congratulate people for the robustness of that debate uh, and putting stuff on the table they think needs to be on the table. Anybody else that want to talk about this, speak about this, speak to this? Okay, we won't hold the process. Oh, Councillor Edge, I'll go back. Do you count? So lots of hands going up here. So sort of bad, 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 bad. Genevieve. I was just going to comment as well on the biodiversity side of things. Um, I'm a broken record when it comes to that, but yeah, um, what we come to is never enough uh, money in the kitty for that. And um, yeah, I'm disagreeing with uh, Councillor Southworth. Thank you. Um, like all four first times, I certainly will remember this. Everybody else is um, saying, but um, you know, I just wanted to reflect on um, what was, you know, the future for local government paper that's just come out talking about peak rates, um, and I'm cognizant of that. Um, you know, every time that we have this conversation, and 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 the the pressures that are on us as a council to sort of deliver the things that we want to deliver, uh, but within the within the bucket that our ratepayers can afford at this point in time. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I, wanted, I was just reflecting on is, you know, this is year three of the last council's um, budget. Um, so I'm really looking forward to starting to get onto the work of this council's budget for the next three years. Um, so that we could probably start tomorrow and I'm um, looking forward to seeing how that plays out over the next, you know, six to nine months. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks everybody for for comments. Um, just just to sort of wrap up a little bit, um, I, I, we acknowledge that this is this is a constrained, um, but a socially responsible approach to deal with current economic priorities and pressures. However, this means, as I said before, that we will be in catch up mode to deal with um, broader environmental issues. Issues that will be needed to deliver outcomes which are necessary to address our climate and ecological emergency at a faster pace. But going forward, I think climate change impacts, adaptation, and mitigations will dominate our budgetary considerations. This means addressing lost biodiversity, reshaping river management, and looking at holistic and integrated management solutions for the environment and our people. The feedback that we got through the submission and, and the feedback process um, gave us a good steer as to the key issues for consideration and the development of the next long term plan. But achieving the community's aspirations may mean looking at a different way of rating to meet future challenges, and it will certainly require more government and interagency cooperation, direction and investment. And I think adopting the plan today doesn't depart from our long term strategic vision and goals, but what it does do is just defer and reset the priorities. But yeah, thoroughly support the recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the discussion around this. Um, with no further issues here, I'll put that to you. Uh, moved by Councillor Edge and seconded by Councillor Sankel to adopt the Environment Canterbury Annual Plan. Uh, in the form attached to the agenda and delegates the authority to the chief executive to make alterations of minor effect or to correct any minor errors to the adoption of the annual plan. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against. Thank you. All those against. No, that's carried. And can I also reiterate the massive amount of work that um, was has been led by um, my, our chief executive and and. and yeah, can I just talk about you first, though, um, because it starts at the top, and I know that Giles has also been really, really busy, and Brian and others, but I think it's the leadership that we have that's got us to where we are today, so thank you for that. Thank you for the senior leadership team and what they've done. All right. So the next bit really is a follow-on, and Brian, this is your stuff. It's about the rates resolution. It really is just a matter of um, putting this recommendation up, Brian, do you think you need to come to the table? 
Brian doesn't need, think he needs to come to the table, and I'm reasonably comfortable with that. So we put the recommendation up on the table. We've got a mover already in Councillor Swiggs and a seconder in Councillor Burns. Any further discussion around this issue? I'm glad there isn't because it's a pretty involved document. So moved by Councillor Swiggs, seconded by Councillor Burns. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, that's carried. Thank you very much for that. Um, sure, Vivo, do we have any more issues in the open agenda? Oh, the chair's report. How exciting is that? So we'll go to the chair's report 8.10. It's on page 170. Um, I'm pretty comfortable as taking that as read unless we um, need to talk any more about that. Um, and I'm not sure whether we do. I'm trying to find it. But... Seven's looking at you. Seventy. Okay, so just going to that, that's on page uh, one seventy, and the the issues are there that which we've canvassed before about the resilience uh, and co-investment, and we did have that on the table with uh, Mayor Bowen in, and it's a mayoral forum initiative also, which is great. We've talked at some length today about public uh, transport fares assistance, and that work is going on. I don't know if we need to dig into that. We haven't had a lot of success in terms of wiring pines. Uh, and jobs for nature. We have written to ministers. We haven't had any positive responses yet from those, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop trying. Otu Kai Lake, uh, a big pun. So I, I'm not after all this. Um, so can I just can I get through what I'm going to get through, and then we'll have a discussion about who's the transport minister if you want to. I mean, if you really want to. Just noting that Otu Kai um, lessons learned report available. It's publicly available. Uh, we had the minister here that. Um, uh, at, the, at the sign out for that, there's some actions coming out of that which we still get, need to get through. Uh, but we have a significant meeting next Tuesday on O2 Kai with the main partners in the room, um, and we hope to actually uh, make some progress on that because that's uh, that's not concluded. Just because there's a report, that's not concluded. There is a lot of work to do there. Uh, there is a requirement for a lot of cash uh, to go into that. We've had that discussion around adopting our annual plan about the fact that there's not a lot out there. We need to have some support from central government uh, and those other agencies that are involved with an opinion on what's going on in Otu Kai to turn up and do something about it. So we will put that challenge down. Uh, we're more than comfortable doing that. Um, other than saying those things, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to talk about that's in that report, we can. Uh, but I would just go to Mo for the recommendation. Yeah, that we I will move the recommendation and receive the chair's report and seconded by Councillor Cranwell. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. Now we need to go back to PX. So would someone like to move move that we go back into PX? Thank you, Councillor Sankle, seconded by Councillor Edge, that we go move in the public excluded. So the people that need to be in the room can stay in the room. It's going to take us a few minutes to cross over. Can I say that we take our 10 minute break now, just in case we run into that period. So let's come back at three, and start this up and make sure you come back at three. And um, an open meeting, and I've got a couple of things to do before we move to Yan to this out. First thing is to thank, thank councillors for today. Uh, it's pretty, we've been all over the place in terms of our agenda. And you, we've all coped pretty well with that. So thank you for that. And thank you for your discussion um, about that. It's been good. And thank you for staff uh, for being patient with us, stumbling our way, or me stumbling my way, and you probably, which is great. Uh, and thank you, Catherine, always, as always, and, and, and you guys for the work that you've been doing. Um, our next meeting will be on the 19th of July, 2023, um, here at this council at 10.30. Again. Ah, kia ora tātou, o nei anō te mei ki a koe e te emana, nau i whakahaere tēnei hui, tēnei rā, nō reira tēnā koe, ai tautou ko ngā mehi ko mehia ki ngā kaikauni hera, e rau e tēnei, tēnei hui, tēnei rā, a, mehi ati hoki ki a, ki a koe kle e tō ātua tahi i whakahae māua i te, mō te a, a mahere a, a tau. Just acknowledging Claire, it's the first time her and I have voted, we agreed on, uh, on, on the first eight, uh, annual plan, so that's a, 
that's a milestone in itself. Not either. Right? Uh, on that note, enjoy the enjoy the evening, um, and we'll uh, look forward to coming back tomorrow. Not right? either. Katakana nei te karakia, unuhia. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te rutapu nui o tāne. Kia wātea, kia māma, te kākau, te tīnana, te wairua, te arataka koe rā e roko, whaka iria kia ikiruka, kia tīna, tāu mi hie, tāu kia. Kia ora. <laughs>